Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening and good morning and good afternoon to everyone who's uh, joining us here live as we discuss a recent video that I uh, watched just earlier today. Um, so those of you who are watching um, last night saw me on uh, interviewing Abdullah Samir, who's an ex-Muslim. Uh, he's an atheist, and uh, we talked about why he left Islam. And we, wait, no, that was that was Wednesday. I was I was with the apostate prophet. I, I, I can't keep I I can't keep all these uh, all these former Muslims straight. There's so many of them. There's so many people leaving Islam <laughs> that I can't keep all of them straight. Uh, but Wednesday I was on with Abdullah Samir, and uh, so he's uh, uh, he's an ex-Muslim. He's an atheist. And uh, earlier today on Twitter. There was a, a discussion between uh, Abdullah and, and there were some other atheists involved and uh, a, uh, a Christian and Abdullah Samir posted a video and I watched the video and I thought that would be a good topic for uh, me and Anthony since we we're going live tonight. And so we're going to take a look, go through that entire video, all of the arguments and see if um, see if it's a if it's a good position because it's a popular one. It's a very popular position among atheists. Uh, but before we get into that, how you doing, Anthony? I'm doing good. I'm doing good, except for these headphones. Somebody just asked me, "Where's <laughs> Anthony's headphones?" Someone just asked him. Yeah, yeah. We're t we were uh, we were talking about we were, we were we were talking about that before the show. I was going to get him the exact same <laughs> ones, and I was and I was realizing, wait, maybe he doesn't want the exact same ones. Maybe he wants a microphone. Maybe he wants something else. So I told him to go ahead and pick out what he wants, and uh, I'll have those sent to them. So I'll have those uh, sent to him. So uh, if he gets me that link within the next couple of days, he will have them next week when we're on. Next week when we're on uh, live, you'll see Anthony's whatever. You'll see Anthony's new headphones that he picked out, and they'll uh, they'll be totally dope. They'll be they'll be totally dope. All right. Well, I see we got a. Uh, I uh, see we have Abdullah Samir over here, and he's laughing at us. He says, ha, 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 <laughs> you guys are so dumb. <laughs> no, just passing with you, Abdullah. Uh, glad to have you here, and uh, we're going to go through this. Um, we're going to go through this video. Uh, Anthony, this is a, this is a uh, sort of popular position. Uh, this is similar to what Shabir Ali argues. So there are Muslims who adopt. And matter of fact, as a Muslim, it seems like you would have to adopt something like this. Um, because you, you, you have to believe that in the earliest stages, there was Jesus preaching Islam, and you would want to say that it somehow got to what Christians believe today, and so you'd say legendary development. If you're an atheist, it also seems like an attractive position. You don't want to say that Jesus was going around performing miracles or that he rose from the dead, so how did these beliefs uh, come about? Um, but uh, what, are, what are your thoughts on on uh, on this position we're obviously going to get into a lot more detail but uh just in general yeah i think uh well se several thoughts i mean there's several different things that uh a person could look at in relation to this uh, i i think just just thinking if i were an atheist for example and i was familiar with the bible not simply the new testament but also the old testament and jewish belief I, you know, I think there's there's something already problematic in saying that you have to have this later development in order to get this notion of a divine messiah or of a supernatural Christ or a wonder-working Christ and so forth. Certainly the Old Testament itself speaks of just such a figure. Whether or not one believes that Jesus uh, fulfilled those things, uh, you know, or this is, you know, uh, reading things back into it, you know, whatever argument one might want to make uh, against that position— but, but the fact is, that was Jewish belief, and that's why when you read the Gospels, you have the people reacting and saying, surely this is the Christ, right? You know, is the Christ going to do something other than this? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you, you really don't need this idea of, uh, you know, development. And, and, and actually, ironically, at the end of the video, he has uh, something in there about the uh, uh, Lubavitcher Reb uh, who... Uh, attained, you know, cultic status among uh, various uh, Hasidic Jews, and they accepted him in a very exalted light early on, right? I mean, there, there's no 20 years later, 150 years later, or what have you. They're, they're already thinking of him uh, in uh, supernatural terms. So, uh, you know, I already think there's something problematic uh, to begin with, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the whole notion of... Uh, organizing things in a way that makes it more uh, amenable to an evolutionary idea. 
first of all, I reject that whole order of doing things. I don't think that the books were written in the order in which uh, many liberal critical scholars assume. And I think too many Christians have been far too quick to accept some of this. Although I will say, even if you accept some of that stuff, mm-hmm. it still doesn't follow. Right. I mean, so mm-hmm. I'm not simply throwing uh, Christians who hold that under the bus with with liberal critical scholars. But I am saying that this view did originate with liberal critical scholars and it's uh, usually just assumed and hardly ever argued. And mm-hmm. the arguments, when they are offered, I, I just don't find cogent. Mm-hmm. And so uh, we will start uh, unpacking some of the reasoning that's involved in uh, uh, in these arguments as we go through this. Uh, so Abdullah says, uh, no, I was laughing because you made a funny joke. Well, we, we, we know. I, was just, I said I was just messing with you. <laughs> um, you did have a comment here on the headphones. Um Someone said, make sure Anthony doesn't get beats. Those things hurt your ears after a while. Make sure Anthony doesn't get beats. Those things hurt your ears after a while. So we got that twice. Just, so, you know, just, someone just says listening twice. to David hurts my ears. So, <laughs> yeah, I actually think uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think these are I think these are fine. I, I've never I've never worn uh, sort of uh, big headphones like this um, until recently. But um, uh, I've been fine with beats now. If I find out that other other headphones are just massively more comfortable, yeah, then I will uh, I will regret my decision. But uh, just wanted you to have that input, Anthony, and uh, be sure be sure to check be sure to check reviews. All right, so we got uh, hello from Poland, hello from Ohio, hello from Britain. Um, lots of people in who in uh in Ohio, Louisiana. Get the Bosey. Uh, Nepal. Wow, Wisconsin. That's Wisconsin is the Nepal of America. Scotland. All right, so we have uh, we have people all over the place. Texas. All right. Well, we have a ton of. Oh, he said someone said Bose. Someone said Anthony, get the get the Bose. Well, I thought it was Bosey. I know now, what it, 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 to, it might be. But... I, I assume that it was Bose. Oh. <laughs> I don't know if it was. I don't know if it's Bosey. All right. <laughs> so plenty of uh, plenty of options there, Anthony. All right. So we're going to go ahead and uh, get into this. Hello from UK, Washington, uh, Serbia, uh, Sydney. The Internet is pretty cool, isn't it? You can have people uh, all over all over the world. Canada, Indonesia, Australia, Oregon, Michigan, Ireland, New Mexico. And it's it's uh, a lot of people just spread out all over the world. Any anyway, again, internet is cool, and uh, as uh, as uh, as much as things suck sometimes with uh, people trying to uh, you know ban other people from the internet and so on and from various platforms. Uh, as of right now, it is really cool to be able to do this on YouTube. And so we are going to go ahead and get into this video. The original video is I think eleven minutes long. Um, I cut out sort of he after like the first minute he has like 30 20 or 30 second intro or something like that so I left that out uh, but other than that we've got all the actual content all the actual arguments we are going to go through right here so we're gonna let him set this up um, we're gonna let him set up his uh, his case right here and so basically the the argument that will be presented here is how did Christians get to their views of Jesus as a miracle working resurrected Lord well it happened through a process of legendary development the first the first Jesus first witnesses didn't believe those things but later Christians did and uh, the the story just kept getting bigger and bigger so he's going to set this up oh uh, well, I guess we'll watch this first clip, and then you could talk about that. We'll talk briefly about the Lord, liar, lunatic argument. But let's go ahead and get started. Heracles, or Hercules, as the Romans in the modern Western world would later call him, the greatest of the Greek and Roman heroes. He claimed to be the son of a mortal and a god. He said to have performed wondrous feats, and he said that after his death, he would ascend to the heavens to join his father. Now, these are some pretty bold claims. There's several ways to consider Hercules. One possibility is that Hercules didn't do these things, but he really thought he did. If that's the case, he was insane. A second possibility is that he didn't do these things, and he knew he didn't. But a third possibility is that he really did do these things. Therefore, he really was the son of the most powerful God. 
So you need to make a choice among three things. Hercules was either a fibber, a fruitcake, or a frickin' god. There's a whole series of arguments by followers of Hercules that use various texts and stories I won't get into to show you that Hercules was neither a fibber nor a fruitcake. Therefore, Hercules is a frickin' god. All right. Well, that is uh, the argument that is supposedly going to parallel a Christian argument. And uh, this, of course, is the famous Lord, liar, or lunatic argument um, popularized by various Christian apologists. Um, Anthony, um, why don't you go ahead and give us the basic uh, Lord, liar, or lunatic argument? Okay, uh, so C.S. Lewis was famous for his trilemma, the, the idea that uh, given what Jesus said and did in his first century context, uh, you know, where the religion was Judaism and so forth, uh, it, it's not possible to simply accept him as a good man or teacher, which is what a lot of liberals, uh, we're going to be talking a lot about liberals uh, today, but uh, a lot of liberals wanted to say, you know, we, we, we can strip Jesus of his supernatural character, his supernatural works, and simply naturalize him and, you know, claim that we're following Jesus, believing in Jesus, and, and so forth. And, and the point that C.S. Lewis was making is that you, you, can't, you can't do that. You, know, you can't make him a good man if he said he was God and he wasn't, uh, unless you want to say that uh, he was, uh, you know, fruitcake, uh, to use the... Uh, alliteration uh, of Samir, but uh, so so Lewis was working on the assumption that uh, G we know something of what Jesus said and did, and what people thought about him. And he was saying that the options are only that he was a liar, a lunatic, or a lord. It's obvious that he wasn't a liar if you're assuming that he's a good moral teacher. Uh, and of course, when you look at his teachings, you can see that uh, he did teach a, a lofty ethic. Uh, you know, of course, he taught things like the golden rule, right, uh, to do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, which puts a positive spin on the negative form in which some other ethical teachers had uh, had expressed it. But uh, so he's he's not a liar. And if you're not willing to say that, then you have to either say that he was a lunatic or that he's Lord. But when you read Jesus in the Gospels, you read about him. Uh, the last thing that comes out is that this guy uh, comes off as a, as a lunatic, right? I mean, you're, if you're looking at this like, a, uh, you know, as a person who, who at least has some positive view of Jesus as a person, as a human being, you know, he doesn't exude the sort of thing that you would expect from someone who's a lunatic. And so the only other conclusion that you can draw is that he is Lord. And so that, that was C.S. Lewis's basic argument. And, and, his, and the thrust of his point, again, was that, uh, it, it's not possible uh, to to say that he was simply a good man. Mm -hmm. You know, he, he couldn't be a good man if he lied, uh, and he couldn't have said the things he said about himself. That uh, he couldn't have said those things if they weren't true, and be a good moral man unless he was crazy. And so, uh, you know, there there is uh, uh, you know some force to that, right? Um, but what Samir's doing in the video is he, he's arguing there's a fourth possibility, but but that misses the the context within which Lewis was making that argument, and in which more uh, uh, sophisticated Christian apologists would present it uh, uh, to the extent that they do present present it. Mm -hmm. So there are uh, there are lots of different ways to present this basic argument, and the 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 argument is an important one. Um, so you could present it if you're in a context where people agree with certain claims that Jesus made. Like if you're in a context where uh, you're talking to people and they agree that Jesus made the claims, the kinds of claims that are found um, in the Gospels or that he claimed to be the son of God or that he claimed he was going to die on the cross for sins or something like that. And someone is saying, yeah, but I just believe he's a moral teacher. Then, of course, you know, as you're pointing out, you say, well, he, he's not a great moral teacher if he if those are the kinds of things. He's either a liar or he's nuts or he is what he what he claimed to be. Uh, so that's one sort of situation. Another situation is if you've already laid out a case for why um, you believe that Jesus made these sorts of claims. I'm sure we'll, we'll be coming back to this. But um, first century Jews, first century Jews are just absolute diehard monotheists. They're not just going to start worshiping some man. The fact that they did 
start worshiping Jesus Christ makes it sound like he must have been saying something that gave them the the indication that they were doing it. Like uh, that there's, ar- there's already a problem with, with the Hercules uh, parallel, right? The Greeks had no problem with someone dying and then going off to be divine in some way, right? They would believe that about the Roman emperors very often. Mm-hmm. Um, so they had no problem with believing these kinds of things. First century Jews weren't like that, right? If you, want, if you wanted a first century Jew to start worshiping someone, it just makes no sense that he was just claiming to be a regular guy or just claiming to reveal things about God or something like that. The, the Jews wouldn't have wouldn't have, have done that to someone uh, to someone like that. Um, so you, assuming that you've pointed out some of those things, Jesus must have been making some amazing claims about himself. And then you say, OK, now either those claims are are true or they're false. If they're false, then what are you saying? Are you saying he was a liar? Or are you saying he was just plain crazy? It's one of those. You know, you can, you can make the you can make the a, a similar a similar argument um, about Muhammad, right? So you could look at the Muslim sources what they say about Muhammad. You can say, look, either this guy is a liar, he's deliberately making up a religion, uh, or he's insane, right? He really he really believes that he's a prophet and he's just he's just nuts. Or he's right and he's a prophet. Now, someone could jump in there and say, well, what if what if all that stuff is legendary? Well, of course you could do that. But assuming I'm talking to some people who actually have some reason to think that Muhammad made these kinds of claims about himself, uh, you, you can you can, of course, um, launch that argument. The, uh, one more way to do it is to present it as a as a quadrilemma, which Peter like Peter Cray, people like Peter Kraft uh, do. So they don't say Lord, liar, lunatic. They say uh, Lord, liar, lunatic or legend. Right. And then they they go on to show why it, it's it's not based on legend, it's not based on lies, it's not based on Jesus being a lunatic, and therefore that he's Lord. Um, so this is kind of kind of a straw man to be putting this out there as if this is like, haha, this is this is the Christian thinking, and they believe that they don't have to respond to this claim about Jesus being a legend. They don't think that they have to show that Jesus actually said these kinds of things. They just jump right on there and boy I'm going to refute them. And 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 I mean it's not a complete straw man because I know there are people who do that, right? They jump right, they mm-hmm. jump right into it. Um, but in in general, Christian apologists pretty typically defend uh, defend against the charge that uh, that the stories are based on legend. A um, couple things. Uh, yeah, and of course, while it's true that there are Christians who take shortcuts, right? They just jump into this and think it's sufficient without taking into account the possibility of it being legendary. Uh, but when you're trying to refute something, you're, you're supposed to be going after the best presentation of it, right? You, yeah. you go after those that uh, uh, best express the position or, or articulate the argument. And so it could be faulted on, on those grounds and, and certainly mm-hmm. is then a straw man in light of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so the idea there, guys, is uh, we can find really, really bad, dumb arguments by atheists all day long and could just focus on those. And haha, we are refuting the case for atheism by responding to this really dumb uh, this really dumb atheist argument, but you wouldn't really you, you you wouldn't be doing that, right? I mean, anyone could do that. Anyone could. Uh, just to be clear, there are, there are Christians who give really dumb arguments. There are atheists who give really dumb arguments. There are Muslims who give really dumb uh, dumb arguments. There are people all over the place who give really dumb arguments. And sometimes, if those really dumb arguments start to gain ground or start to uh, start to be circulated, you you might want to respond to them. Uh, but generally, if you're trying to show that there's a problem with the atheist view or with the Christian view or with the Muslim view, you generally want to go against, you know, as Anthony pointed out, the best presentation of it. Like, what is the best the best version of this argument? So if you're talking about the Lord liar lunatic uh, argument, um, the actual presentation um, that, that Christian apologists would use today would either begin by defending the claim that Jesus made certain claims about himself um, or would be presented as a, as a quadrilemma. Um, and, and so th- this entire video really doesn't address that at all. But it does go on to claim, it, it, he does uh, build a case that Jesus is, is based on legend. And so, in effect, if we refute that, then the argument stands, right? So everyone get that? Uh, he's going to argue that the story of Jesus is based on legend um, and that it, it developed through a process of legendary development. And so if we actually respond to that, then you are stuck with the trilemma. If, then you would be stuck with Jesus actually making these claims um, about himself. Um, as far as Hercules, notice the parallel already, right? So he pointed out, and, and people pointed over there, well, Hercules never existed. Um, it is possible that those stories are based on a real figure. And, someone, and some, some have uh, 
hypothesized that hypothe <laughs> hypothecary no <I'm> <laughs> hypothesized <laughs> that that he was a real figure in the 12th or 13th century BC and that legends developed about him but notice notice even we if, if even if we assume that he was based on a re, that he was an actual uh, real human being um the Greeks deifying him later um that wouldn't be a problem uh because again we're talking about first century Jews they they didn't do that the, the Greeks would but our earliest reference that I'm aware of to him being a figure of worship is I think in the 6th century BC. So if you're talking about legendary development, you're talking about legends developing over many, many centuries. And so if that's supposed to be a parallel to Jesus, these legends developing, well, we're going to go ahead and take a look at how much time you have uh, in uh, in the course of the, the first century to get to where uh, you have these kinds of legends. And guess what? This guy is not going to get much of anything right. All right, so uh, we ready to uh, jump on this, Anthony? Yes, sirree. All right, let's go ahead and get into the argument. Christians and atheists watching this right now are in total agreement. This logic is this. It's incomplete, right? The problem lies in the first premise. Obviously, those can't be the only three possibilities. Hey, maybe Hercules didn't exist. Let's replace Hercules with another person born of a mortal with a god as a father. This argument, referred to as liar, lunatic, or lord, was first made popular by Christian apologist C.S. Lewis, the guy who wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. The poor man, the lord of the rings. His liar, lunatic, or lord trilemma is the response when people say that Jesus was a great moral teacher, but not the son of God. They make this the first premise, and then through a series of arguments, they say Jesus was neither a liar nor a lunatic, therefore Jesus is Lord. Christians love to set up these false boundaries in point number one, and then they draw you in and argue the hell out of the second premise, but I don't even want to go that far. The first premise fails for Jesus just like it fails for Hercules. These are not the only three possibilities, and I don't want to even argue that Jesus did not exist. I want to argue here that there's another cute and catchy little L word to add to this choice, and like always... I want to use the Bible to make my point. All right, Anthony. Well, he got us there. He points out that Christians pretend that there is not a fourth option. We pretend that there is no objection to the historicity of the claims of Jesus. That's what we pretend, even though you can go to basically any modern Christian work of apologetics and find a defense of Jesus' claims about himself. Uh, but... Let, let, let's let's just assume, let's just assume he's right. And we, we that somehow slipped our mind. Oops. We forgot that we had to defend the idea that Jesus actually made these claims about himself. So he got us. It's a horrible, flawed argument. And we'll have to turn to his uh, turn to um, his argument to see if he actually makes a good case that this is legendary development. I did want to point out this comment from uh, Arlen three here. He says, uh, is there a good porno? Because I put up, a, I put up a comment on there that said the background music sounds like a bad porno. So he said, is there a good porno? Uh, and he I'm, says, uh, huh? <laughs> I, I was looking at that. I didn't hear you make that comment. So I'm looking at his, uh, his thing. And I'm no, saying, I had it on the screen. Anthony's sitting there going, what? Is he asking for a good porno? I'm thinking, is this a typo? I'm trying to figure out. I, I, whenever I think somebody made a typo, I try and think of a keyboard, and I think of what letters could possibly have been mm. near their fingers, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to make sense out of it. And, yeah, yeah. Well, so, it's good uh, to hear. Yeah, so, yeah, that was a response to a, a comment about the music. But he said, also, let me pay for Anthony's headset, or most of it. I use Bone, is that conduction technology? Or was that supposed to be conduction technology? I don't know what, I don't know what that is. No more sweaty ears or ear infections. Huh. Thank well, you so much, Micah. I don't, I don't know what Thank that you. is. And that's cool because someone gave 100 bucks last week and then said that uh, they were going to uh, – and I, and then I said, oh, cool, thanks. Um, I'll go ahead and, and get Anthony some awesome headphones with that. But now you've paid for it again, so I can either pocket that money or Anthony can get some really, really well, awesome headphones. Or David David was uh, you know, mentioning to me before the show that how much he would really like a pink pair so he could switch yeah. them up and uh, so if maybe you'll get if you want a pink pair pink Anthony ones. if you want a pink <laughs> if you want me to get you a pink pair I will get you a pink pair come on oh all right uh, wait what is this uh, sorry Anthony and David 
Jesus does not come out as deluded. He believed the world was about to come to an end and was an eschatologist. His followers were convinced of the same. Um, Uh, Let me respond to that quickly because I saw that comment mm -hmm. and I didn't know if we were just going to let it go or not. Um, It's it's ironic. You know, I I don't think a lot of non-Christians know that the they assume that because liberal critical scholars are opposed to the Christian faith, that they're somehow uh, uniform in how they they arrive at that conclusion, right? They have a common goal, but that doesn't mean they're all in agreement in how they get there. Th- the fact is that a lot of, uh, well, no, I'm not going to say the majority, but th- there is a good contingent of critical scholars who at least at one time tried to refute the New Testament on the grounds that Jesus was an apocalyptic figure who came proclaiming that the world was about to end. Right. And so uh, some of the critical scholars we're going to look at today didn't hold that view. I don't even know if we'll mention them per se. But uh, the fact is, that isn't the the reigning position, not anymore, at least. And I don't think it was ever at any time, although it was a, a very popular theory. But but it's really based on a lot of uh, uh, misunderstanding there. The the old covenant and there's a lot of theology behind this. And I'll, I'll just try and be brief about this. But. Uh, the Old Covenant spoke of, of the world as it was then uh, in such a way as to relate things to the temple and to the, the Old Covenant itself. Again, there's a lot of theology here. I realize some people are going to wonder to some extent what the heck I'm talking about. But uh, for them, when the temple was destroyed and effectively uh, you know, the, the, the Old Covenant was set aside or abolished, for the Jews it meant the destruction in some sense of the old heavens and the old earth and the inauguration of a new heavens and a new earth. Now, don't misunderstand that as me saying that the promises of the New Testament regarding a new heavens and new earth uh, have been consummated. Certainly, we're not living in a new heavens and new earth now uh, in the sense of uh, the consummation of all things. Uh, we don't have resurrected bodies. Uh, people still die. The, the curse is still with us. However, there is a fundamental sense in which it has been inaugurated. Remember when Jesus came, he said uh, early on, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So in some sense, Jesus proclaimed that the kingdom of heaven was near. It, uh, it was brought near in his person. When Jesus performed miracles, which is very relevant to our topic today, if you look at Mark 3, for example, or Matthew 12, Jesus argues that these miracles are proof that the kingdom of God has come upon you. And so there was some sense in which Jesus thought of the kingdom as coming near, being brought near in his coming, so much so that that Paul, right, in 1 Corinthians, could say that Christians are now part of that new creation right now, right? Paul says that we are uh, a new creation in Christ Jesus. So even though uh, the fullness of what uh, is Uh, involved in the new heavens and new earth isn't yet realized, there is a sense in which it has been inaugurated, and Christians now, even now, are participating in it. That's why the author of Hebrews could say that Christians uh, partake of the spirit of the age to come, the the spirit who uh, uh, will beautify and glorify and renew uh, the creation uh, at the end of the world. So my, my point here is simply to say that I think what they're doing in many cases is misunderstanding passages where Jesus is talking about uh, that inauguration of the kingdom. And, and by the way, some of this is also based on, on mistranslation or misinterpretation of certain statements. Uh, but for example, just take Matthew 24, the, the Olivet Discourse, and then the parallel in Mark 13 and Luke 21. There the disciples come up to Jesus and they ask him a series of specific questions. And I don't want to get into the whole thing here, but uh, they ask him, uh, they, they point out the buildings of the temple and, and the surroundings uh, of the temple, right, in, in Jerusalem, and, and uh, how beautiful it is and so forth. And Jesus said, I tell you the truth, not one stone here will be standing upon another. And that's what leads the disciples to say, when will this be? What will be the sign of your coming? Uh, and in some translations, it says in the end of the world. The, the literal Greek word there is, is uh, age, and, and so they're asking what will be the end of the age, and it's connected to Jesus' statement about the temple being destroyed and not one stone being left upon another. That doesn't mean, don't misunderstand me, anyone, that Jesus doesn't uh, eventually address the issue of his final coming in the Olivet Discourse. I'm just saying that 
there are certain remarks that Jesus is making that had particular relevance to the destruction of the temple in AD 70, which did in fact come to pass. The Jewish age did in fact come to an end. And the Old Covenant has, in fact, passed away, and the New Covenant has come. And Christians are partakers of the new creation. We have the Spirit and are new creatures in Christ Jesus. So uh, those who say that Jesus was this uh, deluded guy who thought the world was going to end, you know, he was dressed in white sheets and wearing a sandwich board and, you know, that sort of thing, simply have, uh, they've confused contemporary, uh, you know, uh, uh, millennial frenzied individuals with with the Lord Jesus. Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> um, we have here uh, jihad that like button, everyone, and um, just um, just uh, uh, I know that that people are still joining. So if you if you missed any of the earlier uh, discussion or video clips, you can of course go back and watch those later. But just to give you the the quick background of the uh, the video that we're going through. Um, we're looking at a video apparently made by an atheist who's claiming that he has a really good response to a poor formulation of a Christian argument, right? Uh, Christians uh, argue that given certain claims about Jesus, in other words, if we have established that Jesus made certain claims about himself, that he had certain beliefs about himself, you're stuck with three options. Either he is, he actually is what he claimed to be. He's Lord, uh, or he was making those things up. He's a liar, um, or he's a lunatic. He believed them, but he, he, he was wrong and he was simply, uh, crazy. Um, the, uh, the video maker points out that, well, these things could be the result of legend and Christians don't address that even though pretty much every Christian apologist I know of who uh, makes anything remotely resembling this argument does address that. But uh, that's what he's set up so far. And now he's going to uh, argue that Christianity did arise through legend. So you ready there, Anthony? I'm ready. All right. Let's get into the argument. Hercules actually was worshipped at one time. Christians worked really hard to discredit that. They didn't have YouTube, but they did have Preparatio Evangelica, a work attempting to prove the excellence of Christianity over pagan religions. They discredited Hercules by saying that uh, Heracles' worship came about because of a historical figure who attained cult status after he died. Evidently, there really was a guy named Heracles or something similar who ruled the city of Argos. He must have been a decent guy, and his followers just got a little out of hand, and they made him out to be more than he really was. That's called legend, and it starts with the letter L, so I'm going to plug it into the cute little Jesus equation. Now what is a legend? It's a story that is set in reality, but contains exceptional events that serve to reaffirm commonly held values of a particular group. Now let me be crystal clear. A legend is not always something just totally made up, but it can be based on a real person and then the stories grow as time goes by. Some examples are Vlad Tepes, who became Vlad the Impaler and then Dracula. And then there's William Wallace, who became a Jew-hating drunk. Now, now uh, Anthony, uh, I know you're still listening, so don't listen to what I'm saying. You can uh, you listen to the video clip. Um, just so everyone knows, Anthony is uh, he's on a he's on a delay because he's listening uh, as you're listening, whereas I'm a I'm ahead of the uh, the game. So listening to the video clips, he's listening along with you. Um, but I find the parallels to Jesus very interesting. Um, the parallels that we have so far are one Hercules. So one. We have no idea whether Hercules was based on an actual person. The sources come from so, so many centuries after what might have been his actual existence that we don't know what to believe about him. And then we have, we have Vlad the Impaler, right? The other parallel is Vlad the Impaler, which became, uh, Dracula in, in, in legend, right? And, but, but think about, think about that paler, think about that, uh, that parallel there. Um, Vlad the Impaler was in, I believe, the 1400s. The story of him being Dracula was the end of the 1800s. And it's not being claimed that 
it, it, he's not being claimed to be an actual vampire. It's a story, right? So this is his, this is his parallel. You have Vlad the Impaler. Um, it's called Vlad the Impaler because he would, he would put people, he would impale people. He would, he would kill them and, and display their bodies as a way of, of terrifying his enemies. Um, and then uh, Bram Stoker came out with the, with, the, with the vampire, with the vampire story. So think about this. This is the other parallel to the legend of Jesus developing. Here you had uh, Vlad the Impaler, and he, he, he calls the, the Impaler part a legend. That, that's, as far as I know, that's not. Vlad the Impaler was actually an Impaler. He impaled people. That has nothing to do with the legend. Uh, that was circulating during his lifetime. He was widely known as the Impaler. Um, and, but then centuries later, you get the, the vampire story. And this is supposed to parallel um, the development of beliefs about Jesus in the first century. Now, why is this, why is this relevant? Well, guys, if you're, if, you're, if you're supposed to be drawing these parallels to Jesus, it should at least remotely resemble the, the stories about Jesus. In other words, you should have some guy who's just a guy, and then you get all of these, you get all these people um, who are convinced that he did things that he never did, and that he died and rose from the dead and appeared to tons of people, and he ascended, and he's Lord, and you have all of that in a short amount of time. We're going to see how short amount, uh, an amount of time uh, that is. But uh, Anthony, um, any comments on uh, what we've seen so far? We've we still haven't even actually gotten into his argument, but uh, he's got the parallels there. So we've got Hercules, Vlad the Impaler, and William Wallace, um, who, uh, of course, in the movie, in the movie Braveheart, um, what do they say? He he shoots fire out of his, his butt or something like that. Um, that was the legend that had developed about him. Um, something like that. Now, the only thing I'm thinking at this point is uh, I don't know that he wouldn't argue this or hasn't tried to argue this elsewhere. Uh, but at least in terms of this video, I, I did appreciate the fact that he doesn't seem to be trying to argue that uh, Christianity developed out of the Hercules you know, myth. Oh, yeah. Uh, and he, he's not drawing that kind of parallels. I'm not sure that there wasn't any uh, hope that people would associate these two things. Right. But just for the sake of those who are aware of people who do argue that uh, or for those who will come across it, uh, the Christian belief isn't that, uh, you know, God mated with a human being so that you end up with a... I remember that in the Greek system of thought, the gods were not incorporeal beings, right? In, in Christianity, God is an incorporeal spirit. Uh, spirit. I don't know why I can't talk tonight. Uh, yeah, me too. Isn't that weird? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, in, in the Greek system, the gods were finite, and in, in a sense, they were just, you know... Uh, uh, men, man writ large, right? Like the, in fact, that was part one of the criticisms that uh, early people had offered of, of the Greek gods that they were simply uh, men with you know human flaws and so forth, uh, just sort of upsized. Uh, but that's not the Christian uh, Christian conception of God, right? The Christian conception of God is that He is transcendent, He is immaterial, He's immutable, He's infinite, He's absolute. Uh, he's the one who, who spoke the universe into existence, who upholds it by the word of his power. Very different conception of God. And so uh, when you talk about Jesus being both God and man, we're not thinking of him uh, as, and, you know, it's, it's kind of ironic too, right? Because we usually talk about Muslims, and uh, this, this conception of Hercules is very similar to the, 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 the uh, at least the categories in terms of which Muhammad thought, right? Because mm -hmm. Muhammad was a pagan, and so he thought in terms of pagan categories, if God was going to have a son, he must have sired a son with a a uh, counterpart, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have this sort of crude anthropomorphism assumed uh, all along the way. Well, uh, again, that's not the Christian conception of God. A very different form of theism is is involved here. And so, uh, you know, Jesus isn't half God, half man, or, or anything like that. Jesus is... He has a fully divine nature and a fully human nature. And that's, you know, again, very different than mm -hmm. uh, the way the Greeks conceived of Zeus. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, uh, to, to, to this man's credit, we can say yeah. he, he is not going the route that some people go who are really, really poorly informed that want to say that Christians stole this idea, like from from stories of Hercules. Right. In other words, oh, you know, uh, you know Perseus, Hercules, these guys were were part man, part God, Christians stole that and uh, used it to, to make the idea of Jesus. There are actually people who 
uh, are sloppy enough to make those kinds of uh, arguments, and they're disturbingly popular. Um, fortunately, to hit for for uh, for the video we're watching now, he's not arguing that. He's simply using Hercules as an example of how legends can develop about uh, about people who who may have have existed. Um, again, unfortunately, the parallels are really not there. Yes, if you have enough time, many centuries and the right kind of culture that likes to deify people, you can get that sort of thing. Um, if you have a very short time among a people who are diametrically opposed to worshiping some sort of a, a human being, um, gonna be very pro very problematic if, if, if it was just a human being saying very human things for them to start worshiping him uh, very quickly. Um, all right, you ready, Anthony? Yep. All right, we are going to go in, and uh, I keep thinking he's about to get into his argument because uh, I don't remember exactly how I, I cut up the video, but hopefully he's about to get into it uh, now. We'll see. Seriously, though, this evolution is exactly what happens with Jesus in the New Testament. Now, the New Testament is not a novel with a series of chapters written by the same person. It's a collection of different books written at different times by various authors living in different countries, maybe even different languages. Today, it generally consists of 27 of those books. The entire collection of the New Testament was written between 50 AD and 150 AD. Wait a minute, did you catch that? 50 AD. If Jesus was born in the years around the BC to AD switch, and he lived for about 30 years, First grade math tells us we have at least a 20 year gap from Jesus' death in the first books we have about him. 20 years. That's like us now only starting to write about Vanilla Ice. Go Ninja, go Ninja, go! Go Ninja, go Ninja, go! Go Ninja, go Ninja, go! Go, 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 go! All right. Give a quick comment from Abdullah here uh, just before I forget. Um, so, Abdullah said, good topic. Um, but I just wanted to point out to everyone that I'm going to be on Abdullah's channel tomorrow at 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. The link to that discussion will be, uh, well, it is now in the description box. So um, go ahead and click on that. Uh, easier way would be to just, uh, just subscribe to Abdullah's channel. And uh, you can see we'll, we'll be having a discussion there where he'll, he'll be, uh, he'll be uh, interviewing me. So if you want to see that then uh, again, link is in the description box. Now, uh, I find it interesting that he gave, so he gave, the, he gave the parallels of Hercules, Vlad the Impaler, and William Wallace, and talks about the legendary development, and then says, this is exactly what we see in the New Testament. Now, think about that. With Hercules, you have centuries. You have centuries between anything that might have been a... Uh, an actual historical figure and the legends that we we know about him. So you have centuries um, with uh, with Vlad the Impaler. It's it's not even it, what he's talking about is not even really legend. I'm sure there there, there were legends that arose about Vlad the Impaler, but uh, the the vampire the vampire story that's a no, that's a novel that someone wrote. A, that was a, a horror novel, right? So this is exactly like what we see in in the in the new testament anthony yeah yeah uh, i i don't know if we can come up with a better uh mm -hmm. parallel yeah so so but notice right <laughs> he does that record scratch and he goes did you catch that 50 a.d that's 20 years after the death of Jesus, right? So this is supposed to parallel the seven century gap between Hercules and anything we might know about the stories that had developed about him. Yeah, yeah. And then he did have that witty part, though, about uh, vanilla ice and how it'd be like uh, only now starting to write about vanilla ice 20 years later. And I do have to throw in here for, you know, I was thinking as he said that, you know, I could do this. I, <laughs> that's... I, I think that any uh, thing addressing Vanilla Ice must make sure not to overlook Jim Carrey's uh, imitation of Vanilla Ice on white, in Living white, Color. White, white baby, I saw that. <laughs> yeah, that was so funny. He rocked it. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't know what we're talking about, look up uh, Jim Carrey, White, White Baby, because uh, he's a white, white baby. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but uh, no, but 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 notice, right, everyone? 
So he's given all these parallels, right? He's given all these parallels. The parallels are not parallel at all. There is no comparison between uh, Hercules and then uh, beliefs about Hercules that are that uh, developed six or seven centuries after the events, right? You you can't make that sort of case. Um, The best parallel that he actually gave was with Vanilla Ice, that people starting to write about Jesus 20 years after the things that he did would be like us. And by the way, this video is several years ago, um, would be like us trying to write about vanilla ice 20 years after ice, ice baby and so on. Now, what, what's the problem if that's your, if that's your, if that's your parallel? Well, you, you, you should start to spot it, right? 20, 20 years were well within the lifetimes of eyewitnesses. If, if nothing had ever been written about Vanilla Ice right now, we could get some very, very accurate information by going and talking to the eyewitnesses, uh, by talking to the people who knew him. Um, you could get, you could, you could make a completely reliable biography about Vanilla Ice right now. 20 years, I mean, we're, we're more than that after, we're more than that after he became popular uh, now, but 20 years after he became popular, even right now, even right now. Um, so near, we're nearly, we're nearly 30 years after that. Uh, you could write a very, very extremely reliable biography about Vanilla Ice right now, because you are well within, you are well within the time of, of eyewitnesses. Yeah, yeah. And not only that, we don't even have to set aside the writing that we have that, uh, you know, has has been written since the time Vanilla Ice became, uh, you know, uh, a subject to the public. Uh, to the extreme, yeah. when To the Extreme came out. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, we, we don't even have to set that aside to try and make a parallel to the New Testament because, our view, I mean, we re- we have four canonical Gospels. We have four Gospels that were inspired, that we believe are intended to be a part of the canon of Scripture. That doesn't mean that there weren't writings, mm-hmm. right? But, I mean, Luke himself assumes that there were many writings. Mm-hmm. He mentions in the video, at least his view, that, that Mark and Matthew, or at least Mark was written before Luke, uh, but, but Luke at the beginning of his account mentions, you know, many that have sought to compile, right? So so Luke is aware of, of many things being written and so, you know, the Christian position doesn't require that nothing was written uh, prior to the canonical Gospels. Uh, why wouldn't people be writing stuff down, right? I mean, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the sorts of things that are reported seem to me to cry out for people to be scribbling stuff down all over the place, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, yeah, I mean, the, the authors of the Gospels don't have to uh, be writing without any prior written sources, but... Uh, even without those, though, as you said, we still had the uh, eyewitnesses that were around at the time of composition. Mm-hmm. Um, so, 20 years, not a lot of time for legendary development. And so, notice, we're, we're, we, we were granting what he said. There are going to be some further problems with, uh, with some of his dating, which we are uh, about to get into uh, in a moment. All right, you ready to move on here? I am. Fifth clip here. And the books of the New Testament are not all about Jesus and his time on earth. In fact, only a small handful even talk about his miracles. The timing of those become important later. We just can't read the New Testament books in order of their appearance in the Bible because they're out of order. We need to consider them chronologically from the dates they were written. We begin with a guy named Saul, and he was the one getting Christianity to grow. He's the reason there's Christianity today. On the road to Damascus, Saul had his divine epiphany and he changed his name to Paul and he started preaching. His letters to various churches in the region are the oldest books of the New Testament. These letters are intended to give instruction to the growing churches on Christian doctrine. It's also the first time we hear about Jesus. So what do you think should be included in these letters? Just 20 years away from the final epic years in the life of Jesus, wouldn't you think that these early writings would talk at least some about his miracles and his resurrection and his virgin mother? Where to your mother? They don't. Not once like you'd think. It's all very vague. (laughs) Um, I hope everyone noticed he just said, nowhere is Jesus' resurrection mentioned in the letters of Paul. Um, You'd think that Paul would somewhere mention 
the resurrection. In fact, <laughs> I feel like I, I feel like I must have misheard him. I, I feel like I must have misheard him if he said that you'd think that Paul would somewhere mention Jesus' resurrection. I have to listen to that again, ladies and gentlemen. We have to listen to that again. It's only about a minute long. Um, but I want to see if he actually said that. See if you catch it. See if he did say this, because I really think I must have misheard them. Because I know of a, a massive blunder he's about to make in the next clip. But if he just said, no resurrection, wow, this guy should really, really start reading. But I feel like I may have misheard him. Let's see. And the books of the New Testament are not all about Jesus and his time on earth. In fact, only a small handful even talk about his miracles. The timing of those become important later. We just can't read the New Testament books in order of their appearance in the Bible because they're out of order. We need to consider them chronologically from the dates they were written. We begin with a guy named Saul, and he was the one getting Christianity to grow. He's the reason there's Christianity today. On the road to Damascus, Saul had his divine epiphany and he changed his name to Paul and he started preaching. His letters to various churches in the region are the oldest books of the New Testament. These letters are intended to give instruction to the growing churches on Christian doctrine. It's also the first time we hear about Jesus. So what do you think should be included in these letters? Just 20 years away from the final epic years in the life of Jesus, wouldn't you think that these early writings would talk at least some about his miracles and his resurrection? And his birth about his miracles and his resurrection about his miracles and his resurrection and his virgin mother where to your mother they don't not once like you'd think mother where to your mother they don't not once like you'd think it's all very vague not once not once anthony do, do the, does paul mention the resurrection of Jesus. He just, it, you'd think that he'd mention it somewhere, but he just doesn't. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Or <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah. So, you know, th this is, this is uh, humorous for a number of reasons, because one, one of the problems that he has is not uh, realizing the difference between the kind of genre that Paul's writings are mm -hmm. and the, the genre that you find in, in the gospels, this will become relevant in a moment, uh, further relevant. But, uh, you know, for example, he's criticizing the fact that, that Paul isn't mentioning certain things that you find in the gospels, but he doesn't realize that he's not writing a biography, right? Mm -hmm. He's, he's writing epistles that, that, are, the, that are, that are very frequently answering questions that people have that an already yeah. established church of Christians is writing him saying, Hey, we have some questions about this. We have some questions about circumcision. We have some questions about, uh, our relationship to the law. They're asking questions. He's responding to questions. And then the response is, well, why isn't he, why isn't he giving the biography? Right? Yeah. Yeah. This is why, uh, and some people may misunderstand this term, but this is why scholars refer to the epistles of the new Testament as occasional, mm -hmm. meaning that there was some occasion, something, uh, that that caused Paul to write about what he was writing. And so the, given the occasional nature of the New Testament epistles, you can't criticize them for what they don't say. Mm -hmm. But uh, furthermore, the fact is, since he's writing letters to churches that are already established, right, he doesn't have to keep uh, repeating things that he would have already taught them uh, when he, when he, you know, preached the gospel to them, they came to faith, and when he organized the churches of which they were a part— uh, and so uh, the, the the gospel, I mean, the epistles are largely concerned with applying now uh, the implications of Christ's victory over death, his resurrection. And so that's why you don't get a lot of emphasis on uh, his his uh, life prior to the resurrection. Right. It's it's the resurrected Christ who is now seated at the right hand of the father, who is Lord, who, whom Christians are to submit to and serve. And so the focus becomes now not what Jesus did before that but on who Jesus is now and who Christians are in relation to him. And so the, the idea, my, my point here is simply to observe the, the idea that Paul doesn't talk about the resurrection is, uh, it has to be a mistake, right? Because the resurrection is the major focus of Paul all throughout uh, his epistles, right? You hardly get very far before Paul is talking about the significance 
of Christ's resurrection or our union with Christ as the risen Lord. Uh, there, there isn't a single aspect of Paul's uh, theology or soteriology that isn't linked to that, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, there, there's no way to miss that in Paul's writings. Yeah. Uh, let, me, let me just go ahead and read a quick passage, and uh, we, will, we will get back to this passage because it's very important. Um, this is 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, 1 Corinthians, one of the undisputed letters of the Apostle Paul. Uh, I'll start at the first verse here. Paul says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brethren, uh, 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me, for I'm the least of the apostles. And Paul goes on. Um, interestingly, verse 11, whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believed. He's talking about the other apostles here. Uh, whether it was I or they, this is what we this is what we preach. So Paul, who knew the other apostles, talks about Jesus' death, his death and resurrection here, his death, burial, and resurrection. And he says, whether it's I or they, this is what we preach and this is what you believe. And this is all, even though Paul never mentions Jesus' resurrection. By the way, First Corinthians fifteen. Is, is generally called the resurrection chapter because you can go down there. That's all he talks about in, what, 58 verses or something? 58 verses uh, of, of this chapter. is The entire chapter is about the resurrection. And, uh, and as Anthony pointed out, you can't go very far at all in Paul's writings without running into the resurrection. And yet we're being told in a video um, that, you know, hey, if Jesus was really resurrected, you'd expect Paul to mention this somewhere in his letters. And uh, I could set this up into a trilemma, right? Either <laughs> either the person who's making this video is ignorant, right? <laughs> he doesn't know what he's talking about. He's dumb. Um, or he does know what he's talking about. He has read the letters of Paul, and he knows that he's being deceptive. Um, or we're just... All, all, all scholars on the planet are, are totally wrong about the Apostle Paul and First Corinthians, and, and none of Paul's writings are authentic and so on. Uh, it's, got, it's got to be something there. But uh, Houston, we have a problem here, right? There is a problem in the force here. We're being told that these things are not in the letter, don't, do not appear in the letters of Paul when uh, obviously we have, we have the resurrection. As Anthony pointed out, as Anthony pointed out, um, and... Why I find this interesting, Anthony, is you see, you see, it's very similar in the Book of Acts, right? In the Book of Acts, which we're we're about to be talking about with the next clip. In the Book of Acts, um, the apostles, according to the book, the apostles are totally familiar with what Jesus was teaching. The author of the Book of Acts is clearly familiar with the things Jesus taught because he wrote an entire book about that. But when he portrays the apostles going around preaching, they're usually preaching that Jesus died on the cross for sins and he rose from the dead and you need to uh, you need to acknowledge him as Lord. But that's exactly what Paul does, right? So the takeaway message for the original apostles, it's how do you now get into a correct relationship with your Lord? That's the message we're preaching to you. The other stuff about the other stuff about, you know, Jesus' life and teachings and so on, uh, that's obviously important to them. But the message that they're running around preaching is the gospel. That's what we find in the letters of Paul. And so when Paul's writing, he's, 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 he's preaching the gospel and he's responding to questions that people had about the gospel. So this is not a biography. So why is it Paul giving this biography? Oh, it's because those stories hadn't been invented yet. Those stories didn't come around till, till, till much later. Well, okay, if that's the conclusion you're going to draw, but you're about to run into a massive, massive, massive problem with that, even going with this guy's dating. All right, do we want yeah. to jump into... Oh, do you have something well, else? Okay. Yeah, let, let me throw in... Uh, we got focused there on his perhaps incidental, incidental slip about the resurrection not being mentioned by Paul. But along with that, he also said... Uh, this is a, a small point, uh, but he said that you know he had his Damascus Road experience and you know basically linked the, the name change to that event. But Scripture doesn't actually do that, right? Just like it doesn't actually say Paul was knocked off his horse. Yeah. Uh, there, there doesn't say, it doesn't say anything about a horse there, right? 
uh, just says that Paul was knocked to the ground. Uh, but more significantly, I think, is uh, the attempt, and scholars do this all the time, uh, but he, he mentioned that Paul says nothing about uh, Jesus' virgin mother. In other words, there's no reference to the virgin birth in Paul. Uh, number one, of course, that doesn't prove Paul didn't hold to it. It doesn't prove Paul didn't believe it. Uh, that would be an argument from silence. And fallacious, because it, it would assume, uh, of course, almost all arguments from silence are fallacious, unless you have good reason to think it would have been mentioned. Uh, but as we mentioned, the, the letters are occasional, and so there's no reason to think that Paul had to bring up something like the virgin birth. But besides that, there, uh, there there's every reason in the world to think that Paul believed in the virgin birth. Number one, because Luke was his traveling companion, and Luke is one of the two Gospels where we find reference to the virgin birth, right? Uh, Paul's not going around uh, the Mediterranean world or, or the Roman Empire uh, proclaiming, uh, you know, something about Jesus that's fundamentally different than this other guy, you know, named Luke. I mean, mm-hmm. when, when you can see Paul having uh, have a falling out with Mark simply because Mark wouldn't, uh, you know, persevere uh, on one of their missionary journeys, you, you can be sure that Paul wasn't about to be, uh, you know, co-laboring in the gospel with a guy that he had a fundamental disagreement on. Uh, and more than that, as, as we'll point out in a bit, uh, I'm pretty sure, uh, Paul regarded Luke's gospel as scripture, right? Yep. And uh, uh, but it, just one other thing, really quickly, for those who are uh, interested in this. But uh, in Romans one one through three, as well as in Galatians four four, Paul makes an interesting statement about uh, the Lord Jesus that many scholars see as uh, required by the fact of the virgin birth. In other words, he's not explicitly referring or talking about it, but it, it the language. Uh, is used precisely because the virgin birth was in mind. In other words, when you read Galatians 4, 4, it says God sent forth his son, then most translations say born of a woman. But the, the Greek literally says made of a woman or become of a woman. And that's not the kind of expression you would expect, right? Normally you would expect something like born of a woman. Uh, but Paul doesn't say that. He, he seems to assume something fundamentally different or special in the case of Jesus, that he somehow, something different is happening in this case. He's being made of a woman. And, and the same thing is seen in Romans 1, where uh, Paul says, uh, uh, a ser- Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and now, now just notice that uh, so far. He, he not only says made of the seed of David, which again is not the typical way you'd express it, you'd expect him to express it, but he says who is made of the seed of David according to the flesh. Now, again, why would Paul even add that, right? What else do you mean, right? Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's almost as if Paul is assuming there's also another way we can think of Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. And he actually goes on to say that. And he was declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness. And so Paul's saying there's there's two different ways we can look at Jesus, as a descendant of David according to the flesh, or as the Son of God, which is what he was declared to be by the resurrection. Now, this doesn't mean Jesus becomes the Son of God at the resurrection. What Paul is saying is, in the resurrection, the Spirit is now giving the signal proof that Jesus wasn't merely uh, the physical descendant of David. He was, in fact, the Son of God, whom death could not keep uh uh, in its power. And by the way, did you notice that Paul made reference again to the resurrection of Jesus? <laughs> uh, yep. <laughs> right. sounds, sounds like he knew about it. Yeah. Oh, hey, check this out. This is an awesome comment. This is from Abdullah. He says, I regret sharing this video now. I won't use it again. That, that's awesome. That's, uh, see, see everyone, that's an integrity book. And so, it, Abdullah, just to be clear, you're, you're totally clear. We're going to, we're going to keep responding to the video because it is a, again, it, it is a popular theory. It's a little outdated. Um, it's a little outdated, but you know it was it was, it was more popular in, in recent years. But uh, because it is it is still uh, still uh, spreading in, in in videos like this online, uh, we think it'll be good to to get to. But we haven't even gotten. <laughs> there are bigger problems. There are bigger problems uh, with this video. And just to be clear, um, this similar things have happened to me. I remember when I first um, uh, started uh, studying Islam again when I was uh, interacting with Nabil and so on. And when I first started posting some things, I sent out an article about uh, 
uh, about Muhammad that I got from a, a website that was critical, very, very critical of Muhammad. Some of the things I had read for myself and I knew that there was, I knew that they were reliable. So I treated this, this article like it was reliable and I sent it out. And then it was an actually a Muslim apologist said, look what the, look what this guy in this article just did with this quotation. He totally, uh, totally massacred the context in which this was written. And at that point, I had to buy another source. I looked up the quotation and he did. He totally misrepresented what Muhammad was saying in this passage. And so I, uh, I had to I had to not use that anymore. And so so that thing happens to uh, uh, to everyone. You can think, oh, I know some of this and this sounds this, this sounds like it's right. It sounds like it's a problem. But if you, you know, going through the details, you might you might later find some uh, some problems with that. So no problem. No problem, Abdullah. Uh, but we're about to get to uh, something very interesting here. All right, Anthony, you ready? Yeah, guys, you don't want to miss this part because this is about to get awesome. This was the this was the funniest part to me. We're gonna, uh, here. I'm going to play the clip, and then I'm going to have to zoom in on. Uh, but 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 uh, pay attention here to the dating of the the book of Acts that he gives. And all right, here we go. Paul's first letters are First and Second Thessalonians in 52 and 53 A.D. It's a pep talk about how to persevere through Roman rule and persecution. And then we go through Corinthians and Galatians and Philippians, and we get all these verses that you hear at weddings. Again, no stories about Jesus. So from 52 AD for approximately the next 20 years, we have these letters from Paul and others that were read out loud to churches. They cited Jesus' teachings, and he's referred to as the Son of God who died for us. But the specifics are slim. The closest we come to hearing about Jesus' miracles during this time come in verses like this one from the book of Acts, written around AD 64, which is 34 years after Jesus. See, it's all vague. Nothing like what is coming down the pipe. All right, now did everyone catch that? Uh, he gives a verse from the book of Acts where it talks about Jesus performing signs and miracles. But he says, look how vague this is. He says, this is what you have in 64 AD. He says that, that, uh, that the book of Acts, 64 AD, by the time you get to the book of Acts, he's going with his theory of this uh, evolutionary development, this legendary development. He says, by the time you get to 64, you've got the book of Acts with uh, this reference to Jesus' miracles. But there, there's, there's no detail there. It's very, very vague. Uh, let me go ahead and play that. Not, I'm not going to play the full clip again. I just want to zero in on that part a little bit, just so we're clear on, on what's being claimed here. The closest we come to hearing about Jesus' miracles during this time come in verses like this one from the book of Acts, written around AD 64, which is 34 years after Jesus. See, it's all vague. Nothing like what is coming down the pipe. So, we've got some reference to miracles in 64. He says 34 years after the time of Jesus, but it's vague and it's nothing compared to what's coming in later sources, he's about to go into Matthew and Luke. But f let me, one more time, just, just so there's no misunderstanding here, uh, zoom in on this. Like this one from the book of Acts, written around AD 64 from the book of Acts, written around AD 64 from the book of Acts, written around AD 64 from the book of Acts, written around AD 64, it's written around AD 64, it's written around AD 64, AD 64, AD 64. I'm sorry, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I couldn't help myself because that was awesome. That was totally awesome. Uh, because Anthony, I, I, I don't know about you. I'm guessing you're the same. Um, that's, that's pretty close to when I would put the book of Acts. Yeah, I mean, it ends with Paul on house arrest. And uh, most scholars would place it around, you know, in that range, right? 62 mm -hmm. uh, or, uh, you know, the, the finalized, finalization of the book of Acts. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's a pretty mm -hmm. standard date. I mean, uh, I, I assume if there was, uh, some room for saying it was later and there was, uh, at least a, a good scholarly backing to that, then, uh, he may be more comfortable trying to push it further. But the fact is there just isn't right. Uh -huh. the, the, uh, yeah, the internal evidence is that Paul is that, you know, Luke is traveling along with Paul, at least in the last half of the book of Acts. And he leaves off with Paul and Roman imprisonment, mm -hmm. right? He's not going to leave off there if, uh, you know, he's, he's still following along, uh, you know, in the years after that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no other good reason to talk about why he just breaks off the gospel at that point. Yeah. And so, uh, but our, our, our atheist friend here has granted uh, a, a very reasonable date of the book of Acts. Now, think about the problem, ladies and gentlemen. 
They, see, see if you can spot the problem here. He's saying, hey, you get to the book of Acts, 64 AD, and it refers to Jesus' miracles, but doesn't go into any detail. It's vague. Why? Because those stories hadn't been developed yet. We didn't have accounts of Jesus' miracles. They came about later. This, this, what you read, this vague account in Acts is nothing compared to what's coming later when Christians really start to embellish this story. Now, Anthony, what is the massive, massive, massive blunder where if he didn't make any other blunder and he was right on the money with everything else he said just by making this claim uh what's his problem yeah well this is the second volume of luke's uh luke acts right acts, luke is acts acts is part two of a two-part series the yeah. first part being the gospel of luke now now i i suspect here just like the gaff in mentioning the resurrection uh, he probably knew, but for some reason just sort of lost sight of the fact that that Luke uh, was the first installment of this of this two volume project. Uh, I, I just can't imagine that he 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 completely you know was ignorant at that point. And you know scholars again, I mean they don't question this, right? This isn't a point of contention with even liberal critical scholars. They recognize the same person who wrote the book of Acts also wrote the book of Luke's for or book of Luke. <laughs> Uh, for any number of reasons, right? Literary style, diction, uh, other features uh, of Luke's writings, uh, as well as you know internal evidence and just the explicit statements of the book itself, right? The mm -hmm. the the book begins by uh, addressing the same person that Luke addressed in his gospel, uh, saying that he's continuing uh, what he had started in his mm -hmm. gospel, and so. Uh, if, uh, in other words, just to draw out the implication, if if Acts is the second uh, part of a two-part work, that means that whatever was the first part came sooner, mm -hmm. and if the second part came in AD 64, then the first part had to have been written prior to that. Mm -hmm. And and that's actually exactly, uh, you know, uh, I, you know, we agree with that date. And uh, that's exactly what we would reason, right? So he basically just, it's almost like he, you know, we're playing a game of volleyball and mm -hmm. he set it up for us to spike. Yeah. Uh, and, and so if he were to go, if this guy were to go to Luke and say, hey, man, I see that in your book of Acts written around 64 AD, you just make this vague mention of miracles and signs performed by Jesus, but no details. That means you obviously weren't familiar with Jesus' miracles. The response would be, what in the name of common sense are you talking about? I already, I already passed around. We already published the Gospel of Luke, which is filled with miracles. Yeah, yeah. And notice this, by the way. So, so Acts isn't focusing on the biography of Jesus now. He's already done that. Yep. But he is talking about the history of the early church from that time onward or from Pentecost on. And doesn't Luke record miracles uh, done by the apostles? Mm -hmm. That's what you'd expect to find in the book of Acts, right? If, mm -hmm. uh, if he's going to be talking about miracles that were done, it's going to be those, and he's going to give them in detail. It's going to be those that are being done uh, at the time that he's writing it or uh, the time period that he's writing about, right? And so, uh, and, and then again as well, when he makes what he called a vague reference to Christ's miracles, Remember, Peter's preaching to people for whom they, they understood the details, right? Peter didn't have to paint that picture for them. Mm -hmm. uh, only if you assume, as he does, obviously, uh, that uh, there's no prior account, mm -hmm. uh, d does, it, does it actually come out as vague? In other words, it, it's spoken in a context, and in that context— uh, Peter could afford to uh, just make casual reference to it without getting into specifics. The people that he was speaking to knew full well uh, the miracles that Jesus uh, appeared to have done. Mm -hmm. and, and and by the way, scholars today, scholars today, even non even non Christian scholars acknowledge that Jesus was at least known as a miracle worker. They don't believe that he would, he actually performed miracles. If if let's say they're atheists, but uh, it, it's it's a uh, it's it's a majority position among scholars that Jesus is known as a miracle worker, and so obviously, obviously, uh, the people in first century Israel are gonna are gonna know that hey, uh, G yeah, Jesus was that guy who was who was supposedly doing miracles or famous for for performing miracles. But guys, so 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 think about this. Um, this guy invents a timeline where in sixty four. The reason this is relevant is he's going to he's going to claim that the Gospel of Luke was written. 
somewhere between 80 and 85, right? And that it was based on uh, the Gospel of Mark. And so notice he's got he's got the Book of Acts in 64, and that which is part two of a two part series. And then he's got Luke coming along 20 years later and writing part one of his two part series. <laughs> Theophilus, yeah, probably, you know, he got the mail and he's like. <laughs> You know, what happened to part one? <laughs> yeah, and then 20 years later, it lands on his doorstep, and he's like, <laughs> what, what kids, we need a better mail system here. <laughs> Dang Roman postal service. It's like trying to get your, uh, you know, your tax uh, information. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good one. Um, so, uh, so, so notice, not, but, uh, yeah, yeah, notice the situation here, because this is, this is a common mistake, too, right? When people write biographies, they, they write biographies of Jesus. Then when they're talking about other stuff, like the apostles going around and the, 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 the things that the apostles went around and did, or Paul is answering questions, there is this strange, strange tendency among critics of the, the historicity of Jesus to say, basically, that if, if you're doing something that isn't talking about the life of Jesus, and you're doing something that's that's completely different. You're preaching the gospel or you're answering a question and you don't include a biography of Jesus. This shows that you weren't aware of it, that you weren't aware of the story of Jesus, that you weren't aware of Christian beliefs. And that is so that is so weird. Right. I mean, j j just think. Right. Just think. Um, let's suppose you're a um, uh, you. Let's say you knew George Washington during during the the, the Revolutionary War. Right. Let's suppose you knew George Washington and, and later you're you're writing a letter answering some questions about United. So you're a leader. You knew George Washington. And later on, you're 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 writing a letter answering a question about the government of the United States or something like this and what we should do. And you don't mention a bunch of very important details about George Washington while you're answering this letter. I mean, while you're responding to this letter, you're, you're answering a person's questions about the government of the United States. Should you conclude, therefore, aha, since he didn't give a, a, a biography of George Washington during the Revolutionary War, he obviously wasn't familiar with that. This shows that uh, this was all legend. This is all mere legend that it developed. Very, very strange argument. It's 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 sad that it's uh, that it's so common. So just to be clear. Oh, oh go ahead. You notice uh, Frederick uh, Jacquette in the comments section. He said he thinks of the Bible like it's Star Wars. Parts four, five, and six come out before parts one, two, and three. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's gotta be, gotta be. Um, that's awesome. Um, so j just putting just uh, putting this together. Now notice what you'd have here, right? Uh, I don't think his dating of, of the book of Acts uh, is is far off, right? I would put it in the the, the first half of the sixties, right? So sixty one to sixty four, anywhere in there is fine, right? But the book of Acts is part two of a two-part series. This means that the gospel of Luke was before that. So you're either dealing with like 60 or 61 for the gospel of Luke. And don't forget, as he's going to point out, it's generally believed that Luke drew on material from the gospel of Mark, which would put Mark when? 50s at the latest. Right, it would have to be 50s at the latest. In fact, you might even want to push it earlier because if it's so popular that Luke's going to be incorporating massive parts of it, it must have been very popular, which was a slow process in the first century for a book to become so popular that you have to include material from that. So you might want to push it back even before then. But notice we're in the 50s with Mark, just given the dates that he just gave. We're in the 50s with Mark. You're within the lifetimes of the eyewitnesses for the gospel of Mark, which is filled with all kinds of miracles, which is filled with all kinds of information. And you're around, you're right around 60 or 61 for the gospel of Luke, which also includes tons of stuff that he said he's claiming in this video doesn't come along till wasn't even invented until decades later. So interesting stuff here. Are we ready to move on? We are. Oh, oh just wanted to address this comment from uh, Simi right here. I don't know who's, I don't know who he's pointing out. He says, wow, I love this guy. I don't know if he, if he means us or the atheist in the video. He says, wow, I love this guy. Every day spreading light throughout society and showing common sense and logic. It'll be great if you can acknowledge this comment, David. Well, I did my part. I acknowledge your comment. I just don't know if you, if you mean 
uh, if you mean us or our atheist friend in the video. All right, so we are going to move on to the next clip. And now he's going to get into the Gospels, which according to his timeline, we would, wow, there is some time travel going on here. That's the only way to view it, if he's going to make sense of all of this. Here we go. It's not until nearly 40 years after Jesus' death that we get the first Gospel, Mark. Mark was written between 68 and 73 A.D., now the story of Jesus starts cranking up. Pump it up! The story starts with Jesus already in his upper 20s. He first turns water into wine, and from there the miracles start to rain down. But by comparison with the other Gospels, Mark is pretty reserved. While it does have a number of miracles, we don't have the all-important resurrection. In fact, Mark originally ended when the women left the empty tomb. We don't see Jesus coming back, and we don't see him ascending to heaven. It's just a cliffhanger ending. Um, Anthony, uh, that was a, a pretty short clip. I, I need to play it again because I saw multiple problems and I want to make sure we address them all. I want to uh, mm -hmm. go through that again and jot that down because uh, multiple, multiple blunders there. Let's go ahead and check that one more time. It's not until nearly 40 years after Jesus' death that we get the first gospel mark. Mark was written between 68 and 73 A.D. Now the story of Jesus starts cranking up. Pump it up! The story starts with Jesus already in his upper 20s. He first turns water into wine, and from there the miracles start to rain down. But by comparison with the other Gospels, Mark is pretty reserved. While it does have a number of miracles, we don't have the all-important resurrection. In fact, Mark originally ended when the women left the empty tomb. We don't see Jesus coming back, and we don't see him ascending to heaven. It's just a cliffhanger ending. All right. So, uh, what are the problems with this clip? Let me count some. Um, so, he says 40 years. So, the uh, he, he, he says this is the first gospel. The gospel of Mark is the first uh, gospel. Um, he dates it between 68 and 73. Now, Anthony, that's a, that's a pretty specific date for the Gospel of Matthew, especially since it... Mark. I mean, Mark, yeah, Mark. Uh, especially since it massively contradicts what is necessary for his claim that the book <clears throat> of Acts is written in 64. Namely, that uh, Acts would have to be written in 64. This means that Luke was written before that. Mark must have been written before that because Luke is obviously familiar with Mark, which would put Mark in the 50s. He gives a pretty specific date range of 68 to 73. Can you inform people why would he believe that the Gospel of Mark is written within that window? Right. So when scholars look at first, when scholars look at something like the book of Acts, they they don't have the same motivation as they have in the case of the Gospels to try and uh, push it so far out. Right. So mm -hmm. you, you often have scholars being a lot more sober in their approach to the evidence and accepting something as obvious as that it was written in the early 60s. Right. Again, mm -hmm. because the, the writing breaks off with Paul in Roman imprisonment. And the reason for that would be because that's where Luke leaves off uh, recording. Paul's he was brought up to date. Labors, Everyone is right? up to date. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when you but when you get to uh, the Gospels, now you've got a problem because you, you'd have Jesus saying and doing certain things early on. Uh, if these Gospels are dated earlier. But even more than that, you would seem to have what would count as uh, obvious evidence that Jesus was who he said he was, because in the Gospel of Mark, you have obvious predictions of the future, predictions, not only predictions, but ones that came to pass and came to pass with uh, surprising specificity, right? Uh, remember, again, I, I made reference to the Olivet Discourse, uh, when you look at Mark 13 and Jesus saying that not one stone here will be left on top of another, maybe people aren't that familiar with what exactly happened in the Roman Jewish War. But the Romans, when they came in and destroyed Jerusalem, one of the things that happened, the the, the emperor didn't want them to burn the, down the temple. He wanted the gold. Uh, but certain events led to uh, the temple being, uh, you know, to going up in smoke, if you will. And, and one of the things that that did was it caused the gold of the temple to seep down into the cracks of the stones and so forth. And so the soldiers had to pry it apart brick by brick to get every piece of gold out of it. 
And then, of course, the Romans, uh, you know, uh, really wanted to humiliate the Jews, so they plowed up everything and, and uh, really made it look like no one had ever lived there. And that's actually almost an exact uh, statement from Josephus, who was an eyewitness to the to the destruction of Jerusalem. He, he said, it, if you went there, you'd arrive at the spot and almost think, am I there yet? Because there's there's nothing to show that this used to be Jerusalem, apart from a portion of the of the wall and, and one of the towers. But anyways, uh so, so scholars actually like the Jesus Seminar, right? They one of the things they'll say is, well, this this can't be dated before eighty seventy because if it is, well, then we've got a we've got a prediction on our hand, which leaves us with a supernatural Christ, and we can't have a supernatural Christ, right? We need, uh, you know, just a, a nice, friendly Jesus who uh, didn't like, uh, you know, some of the reigning powers that, that be uh, that were at the time, uh, but. Some of them will say it's safe to say that it could have been written around AD 68 uh, because at that the writing, point, maybe, the writing's on the wall. Yeah, the writing's on the wall. It, it looks like Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. So, you know, Mark could, he was a good forecaster, right? It'd be like uh, somebody today who saw mm-hmm. events just obviously pointing to something that something's going to happen, right? That doesn't make you a prophet. If, you know, if I go up to, uh, I go I go to the store and there, or I go out, uh, walk past a bar and some drunk guys are coming out and I start calling them names right and somebody else says oh he's about to get clobbered mm-hmm. <laughs> is that person a prophet or he just mm-hmm. <laughs> he just knows that I uh, I just provoked uh, a drunk guy who's gonna, mm-hmm. <laughs> who's going to want to uh, wail on me right mm-hmm. well uh, so that's so scholars are are comfortable putting it that close to seventy AD or yeah to seventy AD uh, but. As for dating it earlier, they're not they're not comfortable with that again mm-hmm. because you have Jesus making statements about events that were uh, in the future and in fact uh, came to pass. Mm-hmm. And, and by the way, there's also a problem if you want to turn around and say that uh, that Mark and the other gospel writers wrote these events after AD seventy uh, because uh, I, I mean there, there, there's a number of things, but one would be. Uh, you know, the gospel writers don't write with such specificity that, I mean, if somebody's writing after the event, uh, you know, they, they could just as easily say the Romans, right? Or mm-hmm. uh, they, they could point to other things uh, that would make it even more specific. Uh, but there's there's enough specificity, in other words, to point in that direction, but not enough that, uh, I mean, if the Romans are going to read something like this, right, aren't they going to? Uh, if you said Romans before the event, that would probably tick them off, wouldn't it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, anyways, uh, not to keep mm-hmm. going down that road, but uh, th- there are problems with thinking that they're writing about these things after the fact in light of the event and yet wrote the accounts the way that they did. If they were writing after the fact, they could have written with much what, much more specificity than they did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, guys, just, just to be clear here, the dating, uh, the late date, for the Gospel of Mark, putting it between 68 and 73, is based on a massive assumption, namely, um, well, it's actually based on two, uh, but uh, one is that Jesus uh, couldn't actual, wasn't actually, didn't have actual prophetic knowledge, right? He couldn't, uh, he couldn't foretell the fall of Jerusalem in that way. Uh, but also, second, that Jesus couldn't just really think that the the temple was going to fall. In other words, uh, people like Gary Habermas have pointed out that just as uh, Mark in 68 could have seen where things are going, Jesus, Jesus in the late 20s could have seen the direction things are going. Even if even if you didn't believe he's supernatural at all, um, Jesus in the late 20s could look and say, wait a minute, the Jews keep rebelling against the Romans. What do the Romans do if you keep on rebelling against them? They eventually come in and slaughter you and start tearing stuff down and really, really embarrassing you. Um, I mean, the, I, the, the Romans, lo- the Romans love to humiliate people in, in that way to, to put them in their place. That was, uh, gosh, who was it? Who was it? Who, uh, who, who, what, what was the Roman leader who, who, uh, came? Oh, Pompey, Pompey. When Pompey came to Israel, he went into the temple and went right into the Holy of Holies, right? Which, which no one but priests, uh, no one but the high priest was allowed to go into ever. It horrified everyone by just marching right up in there. They love to do that, to kind of put you in your place. Uh, so anyway, the point here is, 
What is the basis for dating Mark? Well, the basis for this, the, the critical date of Mark, 68 to 73, is saying, well, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus says that the Romans are going to come, they're going to destroy the temple, they're gonna, there's not going to be a stone left remaining. Well, that actually happened. That actually happened. And so if you don't believe Jesus could predict the future, in other words, if he's not Lord, and there is no God, and there's no way for him to predict something like that, then you'd have to say, well, it must have been written after the temple was destroyed uh, or right before the temple was going to be destroyed. And, and people could tell that the Romans were coming to destroy the temple. But under no circumstances could the, could the Gospel of Mark be very, uh, very early. Um, but even if, even if you didn't want to go in a supernatural direction, it could be pointed out Jesus could have made that prediction anyway. So even from a, a critical or skeptical uh, position, how can you say that Jesus, even if he had no supernatural knowledge, couldn't have predicted the Romans were going to come and destroy it and, 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 and lay that place bare when the Romans were the Romans would do do that kind of thing? So, yeah, and, oh, and besides that, the Old Testament itself had already said the temple was going to be destroyed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? You already had the destruction of the first temple. You have the expectation of a second temple being built. Uh, but then you have somebody like Daniel writing during that time period talking about the destruction of the city and the sanctuary that was going to happen in the future, right? So uh, to say that Jesus couldn't have we, – we have to date this gospel uh, after the destruction of the, of the temple or so near to it that he must have known it from the writing on the wall, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, but that doesn't follow because he already had the Old Testament scriptures – uh, that's, but, but what's interesting, though, I, if I can just throw in here, is that the, the Old Testament scriptures that talk about that future temple being destroyed also connect it with the time period of the Messiah's coming. And so you still do have, uh, I think, a significant prophecy that points to Jesus mm -hmm. as, in fact, the one we say he is, the one we say mm -hmm. he said he was, and so forth. Yeah. Um, so, but notice, notice the reasoning here, right? So... Let's suppose we're atheists and we want to refute the claim that Jesus is Lord. Uh, well, when we date the material, we obviously want to say that the material is, is, is legendary, that the stories about Jesus are legendary. You don't want, you know, belief in his miracles and resurrection to be really early because then you have to explain how, how so many people came to believe in them. Uh, it's pretty easy to say, you know, over a period of decades of legendary and, and embellishment, then you get the story of a, of a really miraculous Jesus. So you want to push those sources as, as far as possible. But notice what you have to do. You have to assume from the beginning that he's not Lord. Right? You're trying to show that he's not Lord, but you have to assume that he's not Lord. We're going to assume that he's not Lord, that he had no prophetic knowledge, that he had no supernatural knowledge. We'll start with that assumption, and then we'll go out to refute the claim that Jesus is Lord. Right. Do you, you see how you do that? So we're going to start with the assumption that he couldn't predict the future. And then we're going to use that assumption, which we don't state. Right. Scholars will actually state it in the reasoning. But as this when people lay down the, the date of the Gospel of Mark and they say, ah, 68 to 73, like was just done in this video. Um, he lays that down just as well. This is a fact, even though it completely contradicts what he said about the book of Acts, since we know that Mark was well before the book of Acts, and he put the book of Acts in 64. Now he's putting uh, the gospel of, uh, of Mark in 68 to, 68 to 73, so after the book of Acts. Um, just ignores that, states it as a fact. This is when it was written. Not bothering to inform his listeners that that is based on a huge assumption that Jesus, whether from supernatural means or natural means, could not have predicted the fall of Jerusalem. Well, that's a huge assumption if you're setting out to prove that Jesus is not who Christians claim he is, right? Because Christians are not going to grant that assumption. A Christian is not going to say, okay, yeah, let's, assume, let's start off by assuming that he's just a regular human being. And obviously we have to push the, the dates of the Gospels really far back then. Um, that, no Christian is going to grant that assumption. And no one who believes in God should grant that assumption. Um, so... Who is, this, who is this meant to persuade? If it's meant to show Christians, hey, we have a really bad argument here. Um, well, yes, if we, if we start off, if we all agree on the assumption that, that there is no God and that supernatural knowledge is impossible, of course we're going to have to reject Jesus. Well, that's brilliant. That's a brilliant argument. But that's actually the argument this guy is using. He's just not saying it. He's, let's start off with an assumption of naturalism. Let's start off with an assumption that Jesus is not who Christians claim he, 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 they are. Uh, claim that he is. And then let's go on to prove what we set out. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a circular argument. So the main thrust of this is a straw man. He's giving like the, 
he's giving a version of the argument that Christians just don't use, uh, or at least at, at least actual Christian apologists don't use. Uh, so he's basing this argument on a straw man, and then he's and then the entire his entire response is circular. Right. Let's start off by assuming Jesus was just a regular guy. And then let me use that assumption to go on and prove that Jesus was just a regular guy. Not a good method. Uh, a couple other things that he uh, problems there, Anthony, he starts, he starts, <laughs> he says, uh, so we finally get to the gospel of Mark. And that's where we, re that's where the miracles start. The first thing he does is turn water into wine. <laughs> you see a problem there? I mean, that would be basic, basic bad knowledge of the Bible. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, that's from John too. Uh, it's not found in Mark's account. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so, he, so the first miracle he wants to say the actual story that we have, the miracle story, is uh, water into wine. And as Anthony pointed out, that's from the Gospel of John, not the Gospel of Mark. So, Anthony, I'm starting to think because you, 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 you're inclined to keep giving him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe he just misspoke here or something like that. I'm thinking that he's a guy who actually doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. He watched well, he watched some other people's videos, jotted some things down. Uh, but he really just doesn't know even the basics. He's just, he's just, you know, he's just spouting off some things he saw from some other people. Because it would be hard to believe that in in a prepared video where he actually, because this isn't him speaking in a, you know, and uh, on a campus off the cuff, right? He scripted this out, read yeah. it out, and then and then put graphics to it. Um, well, when it came to the resurrection, I was thinking that he just kind of got carried away, right? You, you don't have uh, all of the the other claims that, mm -hmm. uh, in Paul already that you're going to get in the other Gospels. Uh, but now that I am hearing some of these other things, which I didn't pick up before, mm -hmm. you know, it does seem more likely that he's just, uh, you know, he's either got to be just really poorly informed or he's deliberately, you know, doing some of these things. But there doesn't seem to be any good reason to think he's deliberately saying changing water into wine, right? It was his first miracle. There doesn't seem to be any uh, usefulness to that mm -hmm. mistake. So I think he's just making a lot of mistakes. He doesn't have a lot of uh, uh in full, you know, well-informed. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so he picked up, he picked up some things to criticize uh, Christianity with, without actually doing any, any amount of studying. And so he doesn't know how he's contradicting himself and making basic factual errors. Uh, so water in the wine, that's a small detail. That's just a factual mistake. Um, the miracles, he says, uh, he says that Mark is the least miraculous of the gospels uh, because it's the, it's the first and the, the, this is the least miraculous of the Gospels. Um, it, it, to, to be clear, everyone, Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, right? It's the shortest, right? The others are significantly longer than Mark, and they therefore have more content. But I actually did the counting. I'm not sure I'm remembering this correctly. I believe I counted at some point. There are 18. There are 18 miracles recorded in Mark. There are 20 recorded in Matthew, 20 recorded in Luke, seven recorded in John. Now notice, so you say, oh, it went from 18 to 20 in these other two gospels. Well, those, those other two gospels are much longer. So if you, if you basically do uh, a ratio of miracles to number of verses or miracles to length of the gospel, Mark is the most miraculous, right? It contains the most miracles per number of verses of any of the gospels. The Gospel of John is the last. It should be the most embellished. It contains by far the fewest number of miracles. How, how, do, you, how do you make the claim that this guy is making and not see <clears throat> that the evidence absolutely flies in the face of, of what you just said? Right? Yeah, you know, there's, a, there's another interesting fact, too. Uh, one of the things that you get a lot of in Mark's account are exorcisms. Jesus demonstrating his power over the demons. Now, obviously, a naturalist isn't going to accept this, but again, he's he's trying to say that you've got an evolution going on here. So he has to account for this, right? In Mark's gospel, you've got exorcisms. In fact, uh, if I'm not mistaken, you have an exorcism in Mark's gospel before you get a, a, a miracle of healing, right? You have uh, Jesus healing Simon's uh, mother-in-law, but uh, uh, b even before that, in the first chapter, you have uh, Jesus. Uh, well, he's healing a man with an unclean spirit, but he does so by driving the demon out of him, right? So, but when you get to John's gospel, how many exorcisms do you see there? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, there's none, right? So, so here's Jesus in the less embellished, uh, you know, more naturalistic Jesus, the more manageable Jesus, uh, you know, the account of the more manageable Jesus, and yet he's pound for pound displaying 
Jesus as a, a miracle worker in a way that goes beyond John and even shows him uh, exercising his authority over uh, the demons. And, and by the way, as I think about it, I don't know that John's gospel has any nature miracles in it. I'll, I'll be tentative here. I can't think of any off the cuff, but you, I can think of many in the gospel of Mark, right? Mm-hmm. You have Jesus stilling the wind and the waves in Mark 4. You have Jesus walking on the water in Mark 6, as well as uh, causing the uh, the ship to immediately be on the other side mm-hmm. of the lake uh, as soon as he steps on board, uh, whereas prior to it, the wind had been uh, holding it back, so the wind also ceases when he gets on the boat. Uh, you, you know, you have Jesus multiplying uh, the loaves. Well, you do get that, uh, that uh, in John. Uh, you do have uh, miracle of the feeding of, of thousands, but mm-hmm. uh, but you still have these nature miracles that easily outstrip uh, anything you see in John. What you get in John are, are, you know, you do get profound statements of Jesus and you mm-hmm. get, but, but even that, I mean, that's accounted for in a number of ways. In one way, I think we talked about this before, but one thing is to notice that John is focusing on events and locations that the other gospel writers were not dealing with primarily. John uh, looks primarily at the things Jesus said and did on festal occasions in mm-hmm. Jerusalem, where you could expect him to make you know, some of his greatest claims. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are focusing primarily on Jesus' Galilean ministry, his ministry in Galilee, which is working up toward Jerusalem, his final uh, trip to Jerusalem. And so they don't really focus on the same things. And so, mm-hmm. uh, anyways, yeah, yeah and, he seems to have it all backwards. Yeah, and uh, the, guys, the, people want to point out, right? They, they, they want to say uh, that the reason you have these different things in the different Gospels is because this, this, this process of evolution is going on. I want to point out, you could you could put the Gospels in any any order, right? You could do it right now. You could say, okay, just, just let's just randomly arrange the Gospels into some kind of order. You could pick details out of those to then argue for an evolutionary development in that order because the guys focused on different things, right? They, they, different, they, they, they focused on different things, right? Mark is very focused on like action, right? Jesus went here, he did this. Then he went there. Then he immediately went here. Then he went over here and did this. He's focus, focused on like, it's very fast paced. Jesus going from place to place doing different things. Uh, Matthew focuses quite a bit on, he, he was very interested in Jesus' sermons, right? He records five of them. Um, so he's, he's very interested in Jesus' public sermons. Um, Luke seems to have, be especially interested in the parables of Jesus, right? So we have a ton of parables in Luke. And uh, John, in addition, as, uh, as Anthony pointed out, to being interested in, in you know, Jesus going up to the festivals, uh, is very interested in Jesus' like personal interactions with people, right? So he'll focus on, you know, he'll zero in on Jesus with the woman at the well, Jesus with Nicodemus. He focuses a lot on, on these personal encounters with Jesus. So you have different writers writing for different uh writing for different groups uh, in different circumstances, focusing on different things. And the tendency among critics is to say, okay, here's, uh, here's, uh, uh, here's the order that I want to argue these gospels were written in. And let me pick out the details that are, that are emphasized more in, in later gospels. And I'll say, you see there, that's the evolutionary development. That's the proof. That's the case cracker right there. And uh, that's just horrible, horrible, horrible reasoning. Um, but very, very common. Uh, now we are, uh, I'd say we got about 15 minutes left to, uh, to get through this, but we've addressed most of our points. We still have, um, we still have a little more, but, um, uh, Anthony, he said, there's no resurrection in Mark. He didn't say there are no resurrection appearances in Mark. He said, there's no resurrection. You don't have that yet. Is that? Would you grant that? Would you agree with that, or would you think this is a this is another massive blunder? I would say yeah. blunder. It's it's a blunder, and you, and you not just when we take into account Mark sixteen, right? Mm-hmm. And even if we restrict ourselves to the first eight verses, mm-hmm. which you know I'm happy to to do, uh, you know, but not not all Christians would do that, though, right? There are there are Christians who would argue for the inclusion of verses nine through twenty, uh, but. Uh, 
you know, setting aside the entirety of Mark 16, it's obvious that Mark is writing a gospel intended to convey the idea that Jesus died and rose again, Mm -hmm. right? You have Jesus in Mark's gospel repeatedly predicting his death and resurrection, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, You have, uh, in Mark 8 is where you have the beginning of these Son of Man uh, resurrection predictions, right? The Son of Man is going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, he's going to be, you know, beaten, mistreated, tried, crucified, and that sort of thing, and then rise from the dead. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, repeatedly, you have Mark uh, saying that Jesus said those things. Mm-hmm. And so, the idea that Mark doesn't think of Jesus as as uh, the resurrected Lord, uh, I, I mean, that's just missing the whole drift of the gospel. Mm-hmm. That's where it's all going, right? Yeah. Uh, and so then, of course, you you do get to Mark sixteen, and you have the. Uh, uh, you know, one of the things, let me just throw this in here uh, for what it's worth. Uh, there's a, there's something that people often miss just in terms of the literary quality of these books. It's just, it's incredible. I mean, I, I often, you know, I have to remind myself sometimes when I'm reading scripture that this isn't just an academic exercise. And part of the reason for that is because when I read the Gospels, uh, I just see an incredible uh, design, you know, fingerprints of design at work that, uh, people who, you know, are trying to miss the obvious, you know, won't, won't see this sort of thing. But one of the things that's really interesting in Mark's gospel is he begins his account by talking about, uh, he says, the evening came and the sun went down, right? You don't read again of any statement throughout Mark's gospel of the sun rising again, mm-hmm. right? You read numerous times of, uh, of morning coming, but it never says, uh, the, the sun comes up. And I'm just pointing this out as a literary observation, right? He says the morning came, and then sometimes he'll even say morning came, but be, it was before the sun had risen, right? So you're, you're like right there on the verge of the sun rising, but you're not exactly there. And I, so I'm not saying that everything, though, in Mark's gospel takes place in the dark. I'm just saying that as a literary point, after mentioning the sun going down at the beginning of the gospel, when Jesus begins his ministry, he doesn't bring... The sun doesn't come back up, not not uh, literally. Not I mean, it's not uh, literarily expressed until you get to Mark 16, right? It says in Mark 16, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And so, if you put this together, what Mark has done is he's basically he's basically uh, you know the sun goes down when Jesus enters into his public ministry. Uh, he engages the forces of darkness. He begins to battle uh, Satan's minions, right? Cast them out, perform miracles, heal people, goes to the cross. And then after, you know, being three days in the tomb when he rises, now the sun has arisen. And it's very clear that uh, this is the, the point that Mark is making. And he, I mean, he explicit, explicitly states it, doesn't he? Mm-hmm. Uh, they went to the tomb and they were uh, saying to one another, who will roll, roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb. Tomb And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they had laid him. You know, and then it says to go tell his disciples mm-hmm. and so forth. <laughs> so, everyone, is there a resurrection in the Gospel of Mark? Is the author of the Gospel of Mark aware of the resurrection. Well, yes, it ends. It ends. Even if we don't include the longer ending where he said, he just, he just said uh, in this video that it ends in verse eight. What do we have there? Verses six to eight. He said to them, the angel said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So it was actually his body that had been raised And then tells him, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So Jesus told you that he was going to rise from the dead. Now he has risen from the dead. Go there and you'll see him. And the reasoning here is, the reasoning in the video is, since it doesn't explain the appearances, doesn't describe the appearances, therefore there's no resurrection. The angel just said he's risen. But he's saying that, nope, no resurrection here. This is the same guy who said there's no resurrection in the letters of Paul, <laughs> where, where, where yeah. the resurrection is all over the letters of Paul, right? Yeah. 
Um, I, I just th this is probably a, a good point to point out the massive problem, right? Because what, what he is telling it to is, and this is the sad part, right? This is the sad part. The sad part is that most people who watch this video, even lots of Christians who, who watch this video, um, who aren't familiar with, with the problems and are just taking it for granted that this guy knows what he's talking about, uh, they're going to walk away thinking, wow, man, the, le the letters of Paul don't mention the resurrection. Uh, the book of Mark doesn't mention the resurrection. It doesn't come along till later. Man, maybe maybe it was messed up. Uh, what's the problem here? Well, he's trying to argue that. So he's claiming that the uh, gospel of Mark, uh, 68 to 73, does not contain the resurrection of Jesus. And that uh, Mark, I mean, Matthew and Luke come along 10 to 15 years after that. And they contain the resurrection. So it was invented sometime around there. Well, what's the problem here? I'm just going to summarize this, but this is this is worthy of a of an entire separate uh, discussion. Um, the passage I I mentioned earlier in First <clears throat> Corinthians 15, scholars across the board. It's only a few weirdos who who do not deny this, but I'm talking Christian scholars, atheist scholars, agnostic scholars, scholars across the board acknowledge that Paul quotes an early Christian creed here. So uh, let me read uh, chapter 15 starting at verse 3 of 1 Corinthians, a letter of Paul. So, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 3. For I deliver to you, this is what Paul says, For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared to me also. Now, why is this interesting? Well, Paul writes 1 Corinthians in the 50s, right? So you're talking 20 or so, two decades or so after the time of Jesus. Paul writes 1 Corinthians. He tells the Corinthians, this is the message that I received, but I also delivered to you. He had visited Corinth a few years earlier. So it was earlier that he had delivered this creed to them, right? About Jesus dying on the cross for sins, being buried, rising from the dead, and appearing to Peter, to, to, uh, to Peter, to James, to all the apostles, to more than 500 people at once, and so on. Jesus made all of these appearances, right? Saying, that's what I delivered to you when I was with you. But he says, I, that's what I received, right? I received this creed that I delivered to you a few years ago, right? So notice, you're already, you're already very early. You're already very early when Paul was delivering this material uh, to them. But notice, Paul says that he received this. When did he receive this official creed? Well, the position of scholars, again, scholars across the board, is that Paul received this from the apostles when he went to visit them after his conversion. Why? Because he says there that he basically went up to confirm his gospel. He had had revelations from God about the gospel. He wanted to go and check with the original apostles to make sure that what he was preaching lined up with them. They gave him a creed. What? Why is this relevant? Well, well, this is this is a, a an awesome area of of modern scholarship, but the the general consensus here is that this creed that we find in First <clears throat> Corinthians fifteen goes back to within about two to five years of the time of Jesus. What do you have? His death for sins, his burial, his resurrection, his appearances to Peter, James, the, all the apostles, more than five hundred people, right? That's the early Christian creed. Why is this relevant? What is our atheist friend trying to argue? That it doesn't occur, resurrection doesn't occur in the letters of Paul. Resurrection doesn't even occur in the first of the Gospels, Mark. Resurrection happens much, much later through a process of legendary embe embellishment. Well, what's the problem? The most appearances ever recorded are in our very earliest source in the entire New Testament. Our earliest material in the entire New Testament. Testament, not according to me, not according to, according to scholars, according to, to, to New Testament historical Jesus scholars, the earliest material we have is this creed in 1 Corinthians 15. And this creed in 1 Corinthians 15, this creed has Jesus' death for sins, his resurrection, his appearances. This is the most appearances listed anywhere in the New Testament. The most appearance, resurrection, post-resurrection appearances of Jesus Anywhere is mentioned in our very earliest source. 
if you have the, now notice, if this had come later, you would say, you see it's embellishment. Well, the embellishment is apparently working backwards. Again, Mark, you have like 18 gospels. John, <clears throat> seven, I mean, you, you uh, in in, uh, in Mark, yeah. In Mark, you have 18 miracles. In John, seven miracles. Where's the, how is this being embellished? The miracles are going down. Um, in our earliest Christian source, this creed that's recorded by Paul that he had passed on, that he had received from the apostles, which scholars date within two to five years of Jesus' death and resurrection, or in the case of atheist scholars, of his death, that material gives the most post-resurrection appearances of Jesus that we find anywhere. Well, why do you have fewer as the farther you get away from them, right? So is this, is this legendary embellishment? Is the story getting bigger and bigger and bigger? No, you have different writers focusing on different things. That's what you have. That's what you have. And so to present it in this way is, is simply, uh, well, it's, it's, it's horrible. Again, it's, it's, it's sad that people would watch this and walk away thinking, wow, just, yep, no resurrection in Christianity, no resurrection until you get to the, the later Gospels. This guy doesn't seem to be a, a, aware of 1 Corinthians because he says Paul doesn't mention the resurrection. That's, the, that's called the resurrection chapter, 1 Corinthians 15. He doesn't seem to be aware of that. He's not aware of there being a resurrection in Mark, which he thinks begins with the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, right? You, this is a guy who seems absolutely clueless about what he's talking about. It looks like he jotted some things down from some different books or articles uh, from like Richard Carrier and other people and tried to put them together into a video and has no clue what he's talking about. What happens? Hundreds of thousands of people watch it and love it and say, wow, you've, you've destroyed Christianity, man. This, this is the world we live in. This is the, this is the age of the internet. The internet can be used for good. The internet can be used to spread a lot of complete nonsense. All right, what do you think, Anthony? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess, uh, it, although terribly flawed, I, there is something that makes sense about this that I was thinking about uh, that people often overlook. But uh, if he doesn't think that the resurrection is found in Paul, then he shouldn't think it's found in Mark. Because after all, Mark was one of Paul's companions, right? Uh, they had a little rift at one point because Mark didn't want to continue on one of their journeys, but they later reconciled. Paul spoke highly of Mark. Uh, Peter referred to Mark as his son in the faith, right, in his epistle. And Peter referred to Paul's writings as scripture. And my, the point that I'm making here is that there's a connection between all these figures, and it, it, it's, it would be extremely problematic to suggest that they're going in wildly different directions, right? Uh, with their, you know, it, it'd be problematic to say that Paul's teaching this and they're teaching that when they're all they're all working together, right? Uh, Mark is is going on missionary journeys with Paul. Luke's the one recording uh, much of Paul's missionary labors in the book of Acts. So Luke and Paul are together. In fact, Luke was one of the few that was still with Paul towards the end of his life, as Paul himself mentions. Uh, you know, <laughs> uh, but uh, so I mean, I, it, it's consistent if you think that that Paul didn't mention the resurrection to say that Mark didn't. It's not consistent with the facts, right? Mm -hmm. Because you go to both Paul and Mark and you see that they mentioned the resurrection. Mm -hmm. But at least you got the consistency there, right? Because mm -hmm. th these two are overlapping in, in their time period and in the time that they're writing, right? Uh, so uh, there's that. But uh, I was also thinking, this kind of goes back to something earlier, but uh, it, it could have equally been pointed out that you know when he looks at the the epistles of Paul and expects to find the same sorts of things that he would find in the Gospels, which are biographical, uh, he, he overlooks the fact that we have other epistles in the New Testament. Uh, and if he's right, that this is what an epistle should contain, then we should expect to find those things there too, right? But we don't. We have uh, the epistles of Peter, we have James, we have Jude, uh, we have the epistle to the Hebrews, uh, you know, and, and you, you find them looking just like Paul's epistles, right? <laughs> they mm -hmm. don't feel the necessity of going into... Uh, narrative, you know, of d detailing historical things as opposed to br drawing out the theological implications of those things or, or the moral ramifications of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, there's just flaws all around uh, as far as yep. this goes. Problems. Uh, check this out. Mr. American Dude says, Robin Smith wants to debate you in the comments section about evolution. 
Talking about scientific evolution. Now, this, this is just amazing, guys. Hey, we're going to have a video. We're going to have a video, and we're going to take this, this atheist video, which claims to refute Christianity and show that Christian belief about Jesus is based on myths and legends. And it's just like, you know, the development of the legends about Hercules. It's the same thing. And, uh, and, and we're, we're going to take this video, and we're going to show how the person making the video um, has no clue what he's talking about, uh, makes all sorts of massive mistakes, uh, commits... Uh, uh, commits regular regularly commits logical fallacies we're going to point all of this out and show that the atheists who are watching this uh need to rethink about what they're sharing abdullah samir has already said wow i i i didn't know that I had these problems i won't share this video anymore but what do we have from other people hey let's change the subject stop what you're doing stop refuting the video and and let's change the subject no no <laughs> that's ridiculous guys why would you want to do that if i say and because it's it's absolutely amazing right it's it's like uh it's like when we say hey we're gonna refute we're gonna refute this muslim argument about uh you know muhammad in the bible and we start talking about it. what do the muslims do in the comment section they start i mean in the chat they start trying to change the subject right no talk about this what what about one plus one plus one equals one ha 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 christian's so stupid right it, it, they immediately start to change the subject why why what, what's uh robin smith are you saying that that atheists are not interested in the truth of this matter right if if i make mistakes i would like to know that i've made mistakes well it, lots of atheists are making the same mistake that this guy makes what shouldn't atheists be interested in that shouldn't we take a look at that why on earth would you want to immediately change the subject so that we never get to any conclusions i don't know interesting stuff it's almost it's almost like you aren't interested in uh, the truth and so why would i want to even have a discussion with you all right we still have a couple more video clips it's 10 o'clock let's try and burn through these i think we've already made the, the vast majority of the points that we want to make um, but let's see. Let's see if we have anything better coming along from our friendly neighborhood atheist. About 10 to 15 years after Mark, we get Matthew and Luke. These books were probably being written around the same time, but they weren't likely to have been aware of each other. They both were heavily inspired by Mark, and they copy a lot of stories from Mark and another lost document simply referred to as Q. But here's the kicker. Matthew and Luke make the Jesus story even more supernatural than Mark did a decade earlier. Together, they add nearly 10 miracles that Mark didn't report. Matthew adds 3, and Luke adds 7. Matthew also has that crazy scene with the zombies. Both Matthew and Luke also introduce the story of Jesus' birth and his virgin mother. These two also give us the resurrection where Jesus actually returns from the dead, and he preaches before ascending to the heaven. So let's review. 20 years after his death, we have no writings. Then two decades later, we get them mentioning Jesus in vague terms. Forty years after his death, we get stories of Jesus performing miracles and leaving behind an empty tomb. Fifty-five years after his death, when there were probably next to zero surviving adults from the time of Jesus, we have a much more supernatural story with new miracles, virgin births, and bodily resurrections. Uh, let me see if I can go back on this graphic here. Now look at this, everyone. Um, so you got the first 30 years. This is the time of Jesus. Uh, no writings for those uh, for those two decades there. Then you have the letters of Paul and others, and everything here is vague. He also puts the uh, gospel, I mean the uh, the book of Acts, in that uh, in that uh, blue period. Um, and then the gospel of Mark. You got some miracles and empty tomb, but no resurrection. There's no actual resurrection. And then you get to the actual you get to the 80s, and that's when you get the virgin birth. That's when you get many miracles. You get more angels, more demons, more resurrection. Well, you get resurrection and you get the ascension. Why, why is that reference to the ascension interesting? Well, he granted that the, the, the book of Acts was written in 64, so in that blue period. And what does that begin with? It begins with Jesus' ascension. And uh, resurrection, we've seen, is in our earliest, our earliest New Testament material within two to five years of the time of Jesus that this creed was formulated. Um, apart from that, um, uh, Matthew and Luke are just bigger gospels. Of course, they're going to include more material. But notice, notice what he says, right? Um, Luke adds seven miracles, adds seven miracles that Mark doesn't include, right? And the idea is that he's inventing these. But think about this. Mark lists 18 miracles of Jesus. Luke has 20. Seven of Luke's miracles, seven of Luke's miracles are uh, are unique to Luke. They're not included in the Gospel of Mark. Well, what's that mean? If Mark has 18, Luke has 20, uh, but Luke has seven that aren't in Mark, that means that Mark has five that aren't in Luke. 
So notice, if the order of the Gospels were reversed and Mark came later than Luke, he would say, and then we see Mark inventing five miracles that weren't in Luke. This is just amazing, right? None of the Gospel writers says, hey, I'm telling you everything that can be known about Jesus, right? So sometimes, sometimes they'll make general comments about, hey, Jesus was going around performing miracles. They don't, they don't always list all of those miracles. Sometimes they list specific miracles. But they talk regularly about Jesus going around performing miracles. Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, claims that he went back to eyewitnesses. So he's getting eyewitness testimony of miracles. But because he lists some things that, uh, that Mark did not include, when Mark was, not, was never claiming to list all, be comprehensive, I'm naming every miracle Jesus ever performed. Uh, because he does it, you see this, this is clearly being embellished here. So do, do you see how this, this entire video is a mixture of uh, misinformation, outright distortion, and very bad logic, very bad reasoning, very poor reasoning? Why is this so common? Why, why are these the popular videos? Um, among many atheists, not all atheists, but many atheists are, are uh, put, put forward uh, videos like this. Interesting stuff. All right, Anthony, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah, yeah. He also, I'm assuming that I was listening to the same part of the video that you were playing. Uh, did you also include in what you just played uh, his reference to the fact that Matthew and Luke come after and mention the virgin birth? Yeah. Uh, that, and it's absent from Mark. Mm -hmm. Now, what's, what's funny about this, uh, if you're assuming Mark in priority and you say Matthew and Luke come along later and they add detail that is... You know, in this case, he's assuming they're adding a detail that Mark wouldn't have agreed with, mm -hmm. right? Just because Mark doesn't mention it. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we're going to assume Mark in priority and make observations about the differences, you know, that we don't necessarily have uh, sufficient premises to in infer something from, uh, what, what's funny is that you could actually turn this entire reasoning on its head. Because notice, uh, when you get to Matthew and Luke, you have the, it's, it begins with Jesus' conception, right? They, they, they take us all the way back to Jesus' conception. But when you look at Mark's gospel, uh, it doesn't record the virgin birth, but it doesn't record Christ's birth at all. Mm -hmm. What happens in Mark's gospel is Jesus suddenly appears in the first chapter, mm -hmm. and he's coming to, to be baptized. This actually, and most people don't know this, this actually led a lot of people in the early, uh, you know, in the ancient period uh, to think that Jesus didn't even have a, a normal birth, right? He just mm -hmm. came right down out of heaven. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it's kind of humorous because, uh, you know, a person could just as easily, you know, argue in that direction. And, you know, somebody might want to say, well, later in Mark's gospel, Je uh, you know, it, it refers to his mother. So that assumes that he has a mother. But remember what Jesus says there, right, in Ma Ma uh, Mark 3? He says, who is my mother, my brother and sisters, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, those who do the will of my father. So it seems like Jesus is denying that she's his mother. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you, could, you could spin things very differently if you want to play those sorts of games. Uh, so, I mean, but it, you, you, you can't force Mark to bring up something that took place prior to where his gospel even begins, right? He's writing a shorter gospel, as you mentioned, and so he's he's glossing over certain things. But it's very clear that this Jesus who comes on the scene is a very different uh, individual. Uh, the, the gospel does begin by declaring that he is the Son of God, and you know that by itself, uh, I, I don't think, a lot of people don't think through some uh, certain things uh, logically, so, I mean, in, in a sense of, you know, we just we accept statements, but don't ask further questions about what's behind this, right? Mm -hmm. What's the assumption behind this? And, and what I mean here is, in the case of the virgin birth, we, we realize that the, the Bible says Jesus was born of a virgin, but we don't often ask the question, why was he born of a virgin? Mm -hmm. And one of the main reasons why Jesus was virginally conceived is because Jesus was not coming into existence uh, in Mary's womb, right? He was a pre-existent person, so he can't, he's not entering, he's not coming into existence, he's entering into a new existence in the sense that he's now uh, taking on a human nature, he's, a body is being prepared for him, uh, he's uh, being conceived in Mary's womb. And so this requires the virgin birth, right? It, it, it presupposes Christ's pre-existent divine nature, and his pre-existent divine nature necessitates his virgin birth. Now, there are other reasons for the virgin birth, such as the fact that he needed to be sinless, the Spirit had to sanctify him from the womb, and so forth. But, but my point is that uh, for Jesus to come on the scene, 
even even in Mark's gospel and be portrayed as the Son of God. Uh, and by the way, he doesn't really talk about Christ's deity much, but he does at least speak in terms of his supernatural character, right? Uh, this this comes along later, but when you read Mark's gospel, it's clear that he's not only a supernatural figure performing divine wonders, but he's also a supernatural person, right? He's, he's the divine Son of God. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's there from the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, Anthony, we have a, uh, an actually relevant comment from Robin Smith. Check this out. Cool. You're about to be stumped and refuted here. Robin Smith said, Virgin birth is made up from the mistranslation of Alma in Hebrew, which just means young woman. And Christians made it virgin. That's interesting. It, it Wasn't the Septuagint translated <laughs> a long time before Christianity? And didn't they translate it as virgin as well? Interesting how, according to Robin Smith, Christians had a time machine, went back, and mistranslated it in the Talmud, <laughs> That's a, which was made by actual Jewish scholars. Um, yeah, how come yeah. no one know that Jesus was born of a virgin when he was alive? Oh, they did. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And notice, notice, Luke, Luke, Luke uh, Robin says he went to the eyewitnesses, that, and that that's where he was getting his information about Jesus. Uh, Luke knew members of Jesus' family, so if you want to know where he's getting that from, uh, there you go. But go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, I mean, so the, the first thing I would just say, we don't have a lot of time, but uh, I, I've had several years of biblical Hebrew. The text very clearly says the virgin will conceive and give uh, birth to a child. But you don't even have to know Hebrew. I mean, all you have to do is read the text, right? Yeah. Look, look at what the text says and try and insert in there the young idea woman. that it's just a young girl having you know, normal no. relations. She's copulating with a man and, and giving birth to a child. Here's how it begins in verse 10, Isaiah 7. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. This is a Hebrew idiom saying, mm-hmm. Ask me as anything as incredible as you can think of, right? Uh, you know, uh, it's it's basically, you know, giving this uh, scale as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. Nothing is too great. Ask me for a sign. And then uh, and, and the sign pertains to, uh, you know, other events that are being spoken of in the chapter. Mm-hmm. Uh, God is reassuring Ahaz. But Ahaz said to the Lord, I will not uh, put the Lord to the test. And then the Lord said, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary men that you weary my God also? Uh, this is Isaiah, the prophet speaking. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. In other words, the Lord asked, told Ahaz, you tell me what, what the sign should be. Uh, and, and Ahaz says, I'm not going to, you know, he's trying to be pious at this point. I'm not going to put you to the test. Mm-hmm. And God says, well, then I'll give you the sign, right? Mm-hmm. And then it says, behold, uh, uh uh, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. Now, just put in there, a woman's going to give birth to a child. <laughs> I mean, really? I mean, <laughs> right? Ask me anything, as incredible as you can think of, uh, and and it ends up being, hey, a woman's going to conceive and bear a child. I guess ancient Israelites had never seen that before, right? Yeah. I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah. So, so Robin, we hope we hope you you understand that. So, you're saying Christians mistranslated. To be clear, to be clear, you said Christians made it virgin. The Septuagint was translated a long time before there were any Christians, and they translated it in the same way. They translated it as virgin. That was it. That was uh, uh, that was the Old Testament translated into Greek. So actual Hebrew scholars translated it that way. Uh, that's how the passage was understood. That's how the passage was understood by the early Christians. You're you're claiming that oh it's just a mistranslation it should be translated as young woman Anthony's pointing out that here's what's going on God is saying I'm going to give you a sign anything you want he said no 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 don't uh, I'm not I'm not going to demand that sort of thing God says well fine then I'll give you a sign that's really going to blow your mind and according to you what God says there is I'm going to give you a sign that's going to blow your mind a young woman's going to conceive and bear a son. Gee, that only happens all day, every day around the world, right? So how is how is that the sign that God is going to give? Doesn't it sound like more of a sign mm. that a virgin's going to conceive and give birth to a son, which is how the ancient Jews understood it? And they only started disagreeing with this when Christians started claiming that Jesus fulfilled a prophecy. That's when it's, oh, no, 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 that's not what it means. And so what you have here is, it's... Robert, this is the same thing that we're trying to show is the problem with the video that we're making, Right. People start spreading around bad information, 
and and atheists who are claiming to be the pillars of reason, the people who only go where the evidence points. Unlike you dumb Christians, unlike you religiotards, we just report the facts. We are the ones who care about truth. And you guys are spreading nonsense and you don't care. Abdullah Samir, to his credit, said, wow, I did not know that about the video. I'm not going to use it anymore. Right? He, he clearly a- actually cares about being right and being truthful. You don't. You just don't. Right. And many atheists just don't. No matter how many times, no matter how many times you refute them and show them, hey, what you're saying here is factually false or logically fallacious. You just don't care. That's interesting stuff. I'm, I'm impressed, Anthony. Oh, look, yeah. at, look, look at this. Look at this. Look, look, at, what Robin, look at what Robin Smith says now. Uh, John Epling, yes, stop listening to everyone else and listen only to retard Christians and become a brainwashed religious person. Retard Christians, right? These retard Christians who keep cor- correcting all the false, obviously false claims I'm making. Well, you see here, Anthony, d- don't listen to the retarded and brainwashed Christians um, who don't know, who don't know about the, the, the Robin's miraculous Hebrew knowledge. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should I should make this technical <laughs> observation real quickly. The 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 term ha el ma, the phrase the woman used in Isaiah seven fourteen, uh, it doesn't. Now you have to follow this point carefully, but I just don't want somebody saying that I misrepresented it. It doesn't necessarily require being translated in uh, all cases as virgin, but it's always referring to a virgin, mm-hmm. if, if you understand what I mean. Yep. In other words, it is referring to a young woman, but the idea is that this is a young woman who hasn't had relations with a the man. There, there's, uh, and, and certainly that's what's required by the context, right? Again, and that's why the Jews who know their own language, right? And they didn't have an ax to grind, as David said. This is pre-Christian when they're translating it. Uh, at least 200 years before Christ. So uh, they recognize that it's being used there in, in that strong sense of, of a virgin. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I'm being clear. And, and Matthew, by the way, I, I don't understand why people, you know, they just act like the gospel writers were stupid, even if you don't believe them. I mean, you know, Matthew uh, cites this passage to explain the how the birth of Christ came about, right, through the Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, do they think Matthew didn't know Hebrew? I mean... <laughs> Uh, Matthew is a Jew. I mean, you know, yeah, you, you don't have to believe. And and he's uh, it's it, it, his gospel is directed towards Jews. Yeah. So so the <laughs> idea, good, the idea, putting a good foot forward. Yeah, they're all going. What? <laughs> That's not what that word means. That's not what that prophecy that we that we've been hearing all our lives in the yeah. synagogue. That's not what that says. This guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Interesting stuff. All right, we have uh, two more uh, two more clips. Let's uh, go ahead and get through those, and we'll uh, wrap up. I don't think there's much more much more to cover here. Let's check it out here. All right, I think this is the end, and then he's got his example of the uh, the uh, modern uh, mm. uh, that Jewish guy from New York that they claim was the Messiah. But uh, he, he makes one more uh, one more argument here. First the last story. gospel we get is John. It was written over a period of time, being finished probably between 100 and 110 A.D. The Gospel of John is different from the others, where the Synoptic Gospels share a lot of text. John is about 90% unique. It's really new and improved. John also presents the highest level of supernatural claims, or Christology. Scholars consider John as more theological and less historical than the other three. This is where we get the phrases like Lamb of God, Bread of God, Light of the World, and this annoying verse that we see at every football game ever played. So after upwards of 80 years, through an evolution that you can follow using the believer's own letters and books, we end up with this supernatural divine being who is the path and the gatekeeper to eternity. This is exactly, exactly how we'd expect legends to grow. They start simple, perhaps based on a real person. The person becomes lifted above all others and is made an example. Then it becomes like a big fish story, where the fish gets bigger with each telling. If enough decades go by, the story will have totally changed and the characters will no longer be recognizable. All right. Now, uh, think about uh, don't miss his his actual argument that he's maintaining. Right. Uh, No resurrection. No resurrection until you get to uh, until you get to the 80s. We, we've looked at that. We've got the we've got the resurrection in the in the early 30s at the latest, right? So he's 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 50 years off in his claims here, right? Uh, the miracles, you know, they, they keep being embellished. Um, all of these things they're they're coming later. And 
No, no, they don't. Uh, making massive factual blunders. And importantly here, gives conclusions, uh, just states them as facts when they are based on assumptions and usually very, very lame assumptions, right? Um, in, in fact, I would say the, I would say the assumption given for dating the gospel of Mark is actually a more reasonable assumption than the one he's, than the one that's, that's underlying his dating of the gospel of John, right? So again, the assumption when dating the gospel of Mark is that Jesus could not predict the future. Therefore, if Jesus does in the gospel of Matthew, I mean, in the gospel of Mark, predict something that happened, it must have been after, it must have been written into it after the events took place because he couldn't predict the future. That's the assumption. I think it's a bad one. I think it's circular. You're assuming from the beginning that Jesus is not what he claimed to be and then using that assumption to then go build your, your case for legendary development. But uh, Anthony, what's the assumption here for his dating the gospel of John 1, 100 to 110? He actually said it. He just didn't say that's the reason for dating the gospel. Yeah, well, if you're going to argue for an evolving Christology, you got to put John last, right? <laughs> uh, because now it's not as though uh, the other Gospels don't present Christ as a divine person, but they do so in a way that is that is different than John's. That is, John focuses on uh, different things, and he brings it out in different ways. And I, I guess, you know, for the most part, scholars are... Uh, they're a lot more comfortable trying to fiddle with what Mark says and what Matthew and Luke say vis-a-vis -vis Christ's deity than they are with John, right? Because, uh, you know, you know, for example, in Mark's account, you, you have, uh, uh, I mean, it's clear what Mark is doing, but again, I mean, you have like in, in Mark 1, the, the, uh, the Pharisees, uh, they object to Jesus saying to the uh, paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven you. And then they say, this man blasphemes. Actually, they, they think within their hearts, it says, this man blasphemes. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And then Mark says, but Jesus, knowing their thoughts, mm -hmm. <laughs> said to them, which is easier to say, right? Uh, uh, your sins are forgiven or get up, take your mat and walk. And, and the argument there is, well, it's easy to say either one of those things, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the fact that the man gets up and walks is a visible demonstration of the the truth of the power of Jesus' words that he does have the authority to 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 affect that, and so because you can see the fruit of my words in this case, uh, that verifies you know that affirms or confirms uh, my my ability to say your sins are forgiven in the other case. The the visible sign proves uh, what you can't see the forgiveness of sins, and so I'm not blaspheming right when I mm -hmm. do this. Uh, now, uh, that, that's a claim to deity. The, 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 it's not that Mark is correcting the, you know, G, or Jesus in Mark is correcting the Pharisees saying, no, others can forgive sins. <laughs> no, Jesus is saying, no, I'm not blaspheming because I do have the authority to do this. And I have the authority to do this because I am, you know, God who alone can forgive sins. Um, but when John does, I mean, John just, uh, comes right out of the chute, right? I mean, John... John doesn't waste any time. He says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And by the way, uh, you know, this, I mean, when you look at the Gospels, it's, uh, like you said, you could rearrange the order of these things if you want mm -hmm. to. I mean, if you're just looking at the Gospels themselves. Well, you, you can, you can, re you can, you can rearrange John because John doesn't include the virgin birth. So it must right. have been, it must have been before Matthew and Luke following this evolutionary development theory because, yeah. you know, when, when, when one includes something that, that is left out of another, it must have come later. Yeah, That's the reason. I would say you could go, you could start with John, because after all, that John starts in eternity, right? Mm -hmm. John starts, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God. Then you go to Matthew and Luke, because there they're dealing with his uh, incarnation, his conception. And then you, uh, after Ma Mar uh, Matthew and Luke, you go to Mark, who begins with Christ's baptism in public ministry, right? I mean, that's not really the order I think they're written in, but, but like you said, if you're going to play these games, <laughs> you can play them any number of ways. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, but most scholars think that, that, uh, John's gospel is more overt than the others, at least. And so for that reason ought to be placed later. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the problem, I mean, really, I mean, if this show was about that, we could, we could, I could argue that every single book of the new Testament was written before AD 70 mm -hmm. and, and just completely wipe off their entire attempt to, to string these, these accounts in a, in a certain chronology and then argue for an evolution based on that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that that would be very difficult to do once you really take into account what these documents say. But but just think about it. All of the Pauline epistles have to have been written before 8070, right? Mm -hmm. All of his genuine epistles, at least, you know, maybe somebody will want to say this isn't one of his epistles or that, but they have to have all been written before 8070 because mm -hmm. Paul died before 8070. Mm -hmm. He was he, he died in the Neronian persecution. Peter's genuine epistles would also have to have been written before 8070 because he also died in the Neronian persecution. The, the book of James has to have <laughs> predated mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the destruction of Jerusalem because he died before 8070. Uh, you know, on and on I could go. The mm -hmm. author of Hebrews was obviously writing before 8070 because his whole argument is, mm -hmm. hey, look, you, you Jewish Christians, don't go back to Judaism. You know, because some of the, the Jewish Christians are being tempted to go back to that as they see these, everything continues on even after Jesus died and rose again and the apostles are proclaiming in Jesus the fulfillment of the temple system in the Old Covenant. But they see all these things still going on, and so some of them are being tempted to go back to all of that. And so the author of Hebrews makes this entire argument saying, no, Jesus is better than all of that. Jesus fulfills all these things. Those were just types and shadows. But you know what the author of Hebrews could have said if the temple had been destroyed? What are you guys, stupid? Mm -hmm. uh, there is no temple. What are you going back to? There's no priesthood. There's none of that. And, and the author of Hebrews actually does say in, in Hebrews 8, at the end of the chapter, he says, the God has established a new covenant, rendering the former one obsolete, and what has been rendered obsolete is about to disappear. So the author explicitly refers to the fact that all of that is about to disappear. But the whole point is, it hasn't disappeared yet, not literally in the sense that the temple's still standing, the priests are still officiating at the temple. But I mean, my, my point is just, you could keep this up throughout the entire New Testament, and you could argue that every single book of the New Testament was written prior to AD 70. Mm -hmm. But we don't need that, right? I mean, we, mm -hmm. he's already given that uh, enough to us when he grants that uh, Acts was written in AD 64. That already pushes Matthew and Luke before uh, the book of Acts, before AD 64, which pushes Mark before that puts it into the 50s, which makes Mark's gospel contemporaneous with, with uh, Paul, right? Mm -hmm. And so all those things that he's saying Paul's not talking about uh, become superfluous, not only in light of the fact that Paul's writing occasional letters that are addressing particular questions and issues that arise in the church, but because there's already a gospel out there, right? <laughs> there's, there's a, Paul, Paul's like, you know, he, he already knows, besides that, though, I mean, it's not as if Paul's writing to churches he didn't already preach to. He preached to these churches. They had a, a foundation in the gospel. They knew what happened. And so, and, and, and moreover, we didn't even mention this, but what is often also overlooked is the fact that there were prophets functioning in the early church. Before the apostles had uh, finished the, the writing of Scripture, uh, there were prophets functioning in the churches that were shoring up that gap, right? Uh, the, the gap between uh, the events uh, of what, what happened, what Jesus said and did, and the composition of the New Testament. The prophets are there proclaiming the, the truth of Christ uh, whenever the apostles aren't there, or even alongside the, the, the apostles in the case where they're, where they're both uh, in the same locations. So, I mean, there's just a lot of things that are overlooked in all of this. But, back to John, uh, uh, John's Gospel uh, has very clear evidence for its composition prior to AD 70. Mm -hmm. the, the mistake that a lot of people, well, I, I don't want to get into all that. that there, there's a lot that could be said arguing for a pre-80-70 date. It's sufficient simply to point out, though, that, that John himself speaks of Jerusalem as uh, presently intact uh, of the temple as a, a uh, present tense reality at the time he's writing his gospel in John chapter 5, verse 2. In John 5, verse 2, he refers to Jerusalem, to the sheep gate, and to the pool uh, that are in Jerusalem, and he, and he refers to it in the present tense. Uh, and that, and was, that wasn't there 70. That no, wasn't that there was after white, 70. It was wiped out in 8070, and uh, a couple things have to be remembered. First of all, it's you know I think some people would probably say, oh well, maybe John is just doing this to make people think he was writing before 8070. But John has no, you know, he you know, doesn't know that three, you know, yeah. two thousand years later, people are going to be <laughs> arguing about the date of his book. Unless you think he's a prophet, mm -hmm. right? And they don't want to grant that, do they? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and they can't say, well, yeah, he's trying to make it look like he's. Uh, writing before, so that he can say that these things that he that Jesus predicted came to pass. But remember, John doesn't include the Olivet Discourse, right? He doesn't include those sorts of things in his account. So you just don't really have a good argument for why John would do that, right? Mm -hmm. He he's not trying to answer 
critics 2,000 years in the future. He's simply writing the gospel, and he speaks of Jerusalem casually. I mean, it's a, ca- it's a passing remark, right? I mean, it's not even like... It's not like John stops and says, "Oh, by the way, guys, this Jerusalem's still standing." Mm-hmm. No, what he's what he does is he's he's talking about uh, a place where Jesus performed a miracle, and he says there is in Jerusalem a sheep gate, right? And then he tells about an event that took place there in the past, but he writes about the location as though it's still there in the present. Mm-hmm. And besides that, if the author of the gospel wasn't somebody who was familiar with Jerusalem, he wouldn't have known about that. Uh, After the fact, remember, the Romans uh, completely level out everything, and and people uh, aren't able to go. You know, it's not like people in the uh, uh, post-80, 70 era in the early centuries would be able to know about these things. Uh, We know about things now through archaeology, and actually that pool has been discovered, right? And so uh, we know about it now, thousands of years later, through archaeology. How is somebody writing in the first or second century— uh, uh, how is that person familiar with it unless he was uh, native to Jerusalem and, you know, indeed was uh, writing at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyways. Yep. So um, just to be clear, everyone, the, the, the gist here is to give a date of 100 to 110, right? The video maker just puts that forward as a fact, right? I'm giving you the official date of the Gospel of John. There is precisely one reason to date the Gospel of John that late, and that is that John is giving sort of a a more sophisticated theological discussion, right, in his Gospel. He's explaining things in ways that the other Gospel writers don't always explain, although you can always find them there. You can find find all of the exact same doctrines that, that John has, in the synoptics as well. The, 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 the massive glaring problem with this, the idea that, uh, that John is so theologically developed, it had to be super late, is that the, uh, Anthony, correct me if I'm wrong, but can't, isn't the Apostle Paul's theology that he lays <laughs> down in his letters every bit, every bit as advanced and developed as what we find in the Gospel of John? Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking I had overlooked something as big as that. Uh, uh, I was thinking that too. I was like, how, how did he just forget that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I'm thinking, you know, Paul, uh, <laughs> Paul is, <laughs> he, this. remember the video presents Paul as the earliest writer, and it puts everything else later. Uh, Paul is already proclaiming the, the, the absolute deity of Christ uh, in, in his epistles, right? In Romans 9, 5, Paul says that Jesus is God over all, forever praised. Mm-hmm. In Titus 2, 13, he refers to Jesus as our great God and Savior. Mm-hmm. Independently of Paul, Luke in Acts 20 says that Paul, he's talking about Paul, he says that Paul said that God purchased the church with his own blood, obviously referring to the death of the Lord Jesus and therefore indicating that Christ is God. Mm-hmm. But besides that, I mean, this 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 is also uh, remarkable in its in, in other ways. But uh, it's always striking to me when anybody, because there are some, there are some who try to say that Paul didn't teach an exalted uh, Christology. Uh, they'll say that Paul didn't teach that Jesus is Yahweh. But the, and the reason this is so striking to me is that Paul quotes the Old Testament many times, but forty five of those quotations uh, are. Uh, include a reference to God as Yahweh, mm-hmm. right? So there are 45 Yahweh quotations in Paul's writings. What's remarkable is that 33 of them, almost, I mean, basically 75% are applied to Jesus, right? And so, I mean, the reason it's remarkable then is because if you're going to say that uh, anyone isn't Yahweh, according to Paul, you could make a better case that the the Father isn't Yahweh. And obviously that's absurd. I think mm-hmm. that's absurd, obviously, yep. right? Mm-hmm. But my point is, just in terms of, uh, you know, uh, preponderant usage, I mean, by far and away, he applies Old Testament Yahweh passages to Jesus in his epistles. Uh, And that's just, you know, that's stunning. I mean, here you are, uh, an Orthodox Jew, right, who was so adamant about Judaism that he wanted to persecute and kill Christians. And here he is, just 20 years uh, in his writings, but but even before that, right, in his mm-hmm. sermons and his preaching and his missionary labors, proclaiming that a guy who is just hanging on a cross, I mean, this is just, I mean, I, I don't think people really understand the, the, the fierceness of, of Judaism in the first century, and, and particularly of Paul, right? They they had been pretty well 
worn down with their idolatry, right, in previous, uh, uh, because of their idolatry on numerous occasions, God sent them into capto- captivity, subject them, subjected them to uh, various pagan powers. The Jews had been thoroughly uh, given a shellacking and learned their lesson, so that by the time you get to the first century, uh, these guys are uh, as fiercely monotheistic as, as you can get, and here's Paul among them, right? He, he considered himself a, a rabbi of rabbis. Um, and, you know, here he is proclaiming Jesus, a Jewish man, who experienced the most humiliating form of death the ancient world knew. He's proclaiming that this person is is Jehovah, right? Yahweh. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyways, but the, here's Paul saying this early. and And so you don't have to... You, you, the, the reasoning is flawed to say that John's gospel has to be later because it teaches an exalted Christology. Mm-hmm. It's flawed when you've already granted that Paul is early mm-hmm. and, and Paul clearly taught an exalted Christology. Mm-hmm. So John doesn't have to come along later to have an exalted Christology. Yeah. So notice, everyone, that was that was the claim, and that that's the reasoning. The only reason for dating the gospel of John uh, that late, the only reason you could have is he has an exalted Christology. He's thinking of Jesus in really exalted terms. Well, you do find Jesus in really exalted terms in the other Gospels, but but even if you didn't, even if you didn't have it in any of the earlier Gospels, you have it in the letters of Paul, which the maker of the video granted were written in the 50s. So think about this. If we know that this exalted theology of Jesus, this ex- this exalted Christology, was around in the 50s, how do you say, how do you say with a straight face that if a book contains this exalted Christology, it must be in the second century? That is, a- that is as silly and illogical as you can possibly be. He states it without defending it, just states it as a fact. Mm. And that is a, that is a problem. Yeah, you know, there's another problem too, because... Uh... Usually when we have, you know, we have, a, we find a manuscript of uh, some New Testament writing, New Testament scholars are always motivated, you know, the, the origin, I mean, in part, I mean, there's a lot of different directions this is going, but one of their motivations, put, one of their motivations pushes them to want to say that these things were written later. At the same time, there's an opposite tendency whenever you find a manuscript. Whenever you find a manuscript, they, they, they want to push the date of its composition back because they don't want the manuscript copy that we have to be too close to the time of writing, mm-hmm. right? They don't like that. They don't like that idea uh, because it, it suggests that uh, you, you know there, there's less time for corruption, right? And they want uh, there to be a lot of time for corruption. And so, it, I mean, it's really kind of funny to watch what they're doing when they're going in two different directions at the same time, mm-hmm. right? But but so here's here's the problem. If you say that John's gospel was written that late. Mm-hmm. And, and there's obvious flaws in, in that reasoning for all, all, the, all the reasons we already mentioned. But uh, now the, the problem you create is we have gospels that go back into the mid second century. I mean, manuscripts that go mm-hmm. back into the mid second century, which means the date of composition, if this is the date, gets very close to the earliest copy we have. Which is, you know, they're already early, no matter how how you know how when you date the gospels right into the first century. But, it, but it's kind of humorous, I think, because they, they basically close the gap when they push its writing late, and, and then we then they have to face the fact that we have these early manuscripts, mm-hmm. right? There's just not a sufficient amount of time then to to, to argue for corruption. Mm-hmm. All right, we have uh, we have uh, one more clip here, um, and then I just want to look at this comment. Uh, SM said, "You guys need to do an Islamicize an Islamicize me style series for atheists." Lol. <laughs> Uh, that's already in the works. Um, if you watch this, if you watch Islamicize Me, Islamicize Me started with us as atheists, right? So that's how we started the series. We were, uh, we were Dawkins fans and we are going to go, we're going to do the prequel to that, right? How did we become Dawkins fans? And, uh, what's interesting is we're, we're even going to have some atheists who are going to be in that series with it. Um, the, uh, the apostate prophet's going to be in there with us, right? He's going to be in there because, because one of the things we want to draw attention to is the distinction between, uh, sort of friendly atheists and 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 militant atheists, right? Uh, we w- we want that to be an issue, and uh, it's cool that some of the you, we'll have some friendly atheists in the video with us as our characters become the more uh, the more militant uh, more militant atheists. I, I think the big question then is how are you going to work Halal Hogan into the script? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, Halal Hogan's not going to be in the prequel, but he'll be in the sequel, which deals with us as Christians who are apostates of Islam and some of our uh, old <laughs> our old heroes coming back to uh, convince us back and persuade us back and maybe try to behead us and so on. Um, but even even before that, just so everyone knows, we're going to have uh, we're going to have uh, some Halal Hogan clips coming up, uh, breaking down some theology. He's a Sunni. He's a Sunni hero. And his nemesis is going to be uh, the Mutta Man. The Mutta Man. You know, remember, uh, you remember, uh, macho, you remember Macho Man Randy Savage is going to be the Mutta oh, Man. The Mutta okay. Man, yeah. He's going to okay. be the Shia. He's going to be the uh, the Shia opponent <laughs> of uh, of Halal Hogan. Anyway, we have uh, we're gonna we're gonna have some fun with that. Um, all right. Well, we have one more clip, and then we uh, have to wrap up. We went way longer than uh, than anticipated. But this last clip, he's just giving yet another brilliant example of this uh, of what we have with this legendary development happening with Jesus. So, all right, final clip here. If you're still not convinced, and you want to argue that not. there's not enough time for a legend to develop, let me part with a modern example. This is Menachem Mendel Schneerson, also known as a Lubavitcher Rebbe, or the Rebbe. He was a prominent Hasidic rabbi of the Chabad Lubavitch movement of Orthodox Jews in New York City. Now, some Jews from this sect believe that he is the Jewish Messiah, and they spend all kinds of time promoting him as such. Here's the problem. He died in 1994. So now they believe he will return as the Messiah. But others believe he's merely hidden meaning he's here, but we just can't see him. This is actual video footage of these Hasids praying and celebrating with him. That's him in the empty chair. That is today, folks, right now. But we have the internet and space shuttles and ever-expanding understanding about how the universe works, but this can still happen. And so this is my question to Christians. What makes you so arrogant to think that this could not have happened in primitive and illiterate Palestine? Okay, so notice it's, hey, there are Jews who believe that this guy is the Messiah, and they believe that he's somehow hidden but, but spiritually present now. If, if that could happen now, why couldn't it happen in the first century? Well, but th that's not what you're claiming happened, right? <laughs> you're talking about, you're talking about uh, people going out and claiming that Jesus, who was publicly executed, um, uh, died on the cross, and rose from the dead and then appeared physically to a number of people, including more than 500 people at one time. And it wasn't saying, oh, you know, he was invisible. He appeared, but he was invisible, like these guys apparently think, right? He's actually walking among them and talking to them and so on over a period of 40 days. Uh, and then ascends, uh, uh, ascends in front of them and so on. So very different from saying, hey, we believe this guy is somehow spiritually present, right? That could... What, there you that happens all the time right that happens all the time people believing that 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 some some new figure is the messiah right that was happening during the during the lifetime of jesus right there were other people that were claimed to be the messiah and you can develop uh, beliefs like that uh very easily but jesus claimed the, the beliefs about jesus it was here are the things he said and here are the witnesses who know that he said these things um, here were the we, 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 we gathered these from from eyewitnesses. And how do we know that this was true? Well, because of the miracles he performed and because he rose from the dead. And in order to make it sound like uh, like this is all false, our atheist friend here has to say, oh, no, these things came much later. The belief in his resurrection came much later. The belief in all these things came much, much later. Total, utter nonsense. He has massacred basically in every clip we watch. He either had a, a, multiple logical fallacies, multiple factual errors, and so on. Um, and that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do in order to make it sound like we just don't have good evidence for this. When if you le actually look at the evidence, when you actually look at the evidence, what do you find? This was the Christian belief from its earliest stages. So once you know the actual facts, namely that the earliest Christians, the earliest con Christians were convinced that Jesus died on the cross for sins, rose from the dead and appeared to Peter, to James, to all of the apostles 
and to more than 500 people at one time. How do you explain that? How do you account for that? How do you explain that away? It's not through, legend is not on the table. Legend is not on the table as an explanation. How are you going to explain it? You have to say, you have to say some sort of mass hallucination or something like that. Well, guess what? That doesn't happen. Not in this way. Not in terms of seeing someone physically present and everyone seeing the same thing, right? Um, a hallucination by definition is something that's in your mind. If I see Anthony here and none of you see him there, well, that's probably a hallucination. It's something in my head. If we all see Anthony here, sounds like Anthony is actually here. Because if I were hallucinating, if I had a mental problem and I was hallucinating, then when I see Anthony and I said, look, Anthony, and the rest of you don't see him, you would not see him because you're not seeing my hallucination. That hallucination is in my mind, right? If a bunch of people are all seeing Jesus at the same time after he died on the cross and they're seeing him and he's there again, how do you explain that? Sadly, 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 the the response that we had from an atheist right here is to completely misrepresent and distort the evidence to make it look like this belief came along decades later and not uh, and that it wasn't there from the earliest, earliest stages. Uh, but but notice there's there's a positive there, right? If atheists, after all the time they've had to really attack the resurrection, have to do it like this. They have to do it like this. Hey, we're just going to completely misrepresent the facts, misrepresent the dates, include all these assumptions that we can't possibly defend, but we won't state them as assumptions because we know that most people are not going to look up these things. Uh, they're just going to believe what we're saying here. If that's what you have to do to deny the resurrection, why? Why wouldn't you have an actual good argument against the resurrection? Why wouldn't you be able to say, here's the actual data, here are the actual facts, here are the actual dates that scholars agree on. This is what this is the actual evidence, and now we're going to argue against it based on the facts that we actually know. Why can't they do that? Why does it why does it almost always have to be a massive misrepresentation of the actual data? Uh, makes me think that when the actual data is on the table, you just don't think you have a good case. And so you have to distort it to make it sound like we don't have a good case. That's what I think. All right. Final thoughts, Anthony? Yeah, well, one, one quick thing about his appeal to the uh, Lubavitch sect of, of Judaism. Uh, he made this, this comment that I don't think he really thought through the implications of. Ordinarily, the way skeptics and atheists want to argue and this he did bring up part of this but they want to say that people at the time of christ were primitive pre-scientific and so they were uh you know credulous they were given to believing miracles that sort of thing they didn't really know how nature worked and all that kind they, of stuff. they don't know what death was you know they're yeah. dumb we on the other hand are uh you know sophisticated advanced and all this kind of stuff Although, I mean, you know, there, there are some ways in which it, it's quite obvious that uh, we're not very advanced, right? Like people a few hundred years ago could walk out into, uh, you know, certain situations and know how to uh, survive in those situations. We'd yep. get out there and we'd be completely lost, right? Oh, my yep. gosh, where's my cell phone? You know, I don't know how to do anything with it, <laughs> right? They'd be out there uh, starting a fire, or cooking food. <laughs> mm -hmm. We'd be over there, you know, uh, looking for matches. or Anyways, um, but... But he just admitted that there are contemporary people who are falling for obvious, uh, uh, you know, for claims that we don't think have any foundation in fact or reality, right? That shows that there's nothing about being modern mm -hmm. uh, that prevents Makes us you from, immune, yeah. Yeah. And we could, but here's the, you know, we could equally turn around now and look at the first century and say, you know, sure, they didn't have certain tools that we have certain equipment, but they weren't stupid, mm -hmm. right? It's not like, you know, people really miss this, but like, you know, they'll say things like, you know, oh yeah, people just believe in virgin births back then. Do you think Joseph, I mean, when you read the the, the, the birth account or the, the conception account of Jesus, the whole point there is that Joseph knows that babies don't just happen, mm -hmm. right? That's why Joseph wants to mm -hmm. put Mary away, and he's going to put Mary away because he knows that it takes a man and a woman. Mm -hmm. A woman doesn't just get pregnant. And so, uh, you know, the reason that he comes to accept that it's a miracle is because an angel comes and says, hey, listen, you adult, this is what was predicted. Uh, take Mary as your wife. You know, the, the child in her womb is uh, uh, of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, it, the, the idea that the Jews are just primitive uh, illiterate people, uh, that's also uh, grossly flawed, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, but anyways, yeah, so so there's there's just a number of things he doesn't seem to have thought through very well, and not just 
uh, that he didn't reason very well through them. You know, the logic was flawed, but a lot of the factual premises were, were flawed. Uh, is you know, Paul didn't teach the resurrection. Uh, Mark doesn't have the resurrection. Uh, uh, Acts is written in AD 64. The uh, first part of it, the Gospel of Luke, is written after AD 64. Just, just a lot of things that are just factually incorrect mm-hmm. and poorly reasoned, uh, even when you do have take take those facts. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so a uh, little advice for, for the atheists out there. there. There are ways to criticize Christianity. Um, where you know you could you could acknowledge the facts and then and then uh, you know criticize Christianity, um, but it, it, you know it's better to do it that way than in a way that makes you sound like you have no clue what you're talking about. Now, what's sad is you know the more you can have no clue what you're talking about and be very successful making making atheistic videos uh, on YouTube. Um, we can see that we can see that from the success of of the video that we that we just went through, um, but. Uh, you know, if you guys are the ones shouting from the rooftops that you are the people of facts and reason and evidence and logic, it's very strange that pretty much every video I watch from from your camp uh, makes huge, huge blunders uh, and blunders that anyone, anyone, any atheist in the uh, in the comments section or the atheist, atheists who are making the videos could easily go through and say, wait a minute, we are the people of facts and logic and reason here. We shouldn't be making these mistakes. Let's correct these errors. But you don't. And it makes it sound like your your real goal is is not truth or facts or being on the side of the evidence. It's simply attacking Christianity. And in, in doing that, uh, you don't believe that truth being accurate is, is important at all. I'm not saying that about all atheists. Again, Abdullah Samir, he, he, he said, wow, I, I didn't know I'd had these problems, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to share this video anymore. Um, so, so that's good. But the, the, the reason, the reason that these videos are so popular among atheists is because there usually isn't that concern for being truthful or accurate. And so how do you portray yourselves? How do you portray yourselves as the people of truth and integrity? And you're just the guys who go wherever the evidence points when you go around spreading massive amounts of misinformation and just don't care about it. Uh, I'm seeing a, I'm seeing a couple problems there. Uh, anyway, one, one quick comment here. Google user says, uh, one more excellent and logical session um, from Dr. D. Wood and Anthony Rogers, thanks, guys. How do you prepare yourselves for the live streams? How do we get How do we get prepared, Anthony? <laughs> David contacts me. Uh, well, actually, today it was a, it was a little better. I think a few hours ago, four or five hours ago, you sent me, "Hey, let's do this clip," and then I watch it on my own. And then David sometimes he'll call me half an hour before the show. Sometimes he calls me 15 minutes before the show. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes he calls me five minutes before the show. <laughs> yep. and, uh, and then, and then that, those five to 15 minute periods are often spent. Oh, hold on. I got to go to the restroom yep. or, uh, Hey, I need some water. Hey, I got to put, I got to put some pants on. <laughs> I got to get my headphones. <laughs> yeah. And, and, then, and, and sometimes I'm David's texting me cause I decide I'm going to run to the store real quick. Cause I have no idea. I, I usually expect David to call me, uh, at like seven 30, uh, but on occasion he hasn't. So I'll think sometimes at like seven twenty. Oh gosh, I wish I could go to the store real quick for this. And then I'll say, I'm going to, I'm going to run to the store. And then David will decide to text me. Where are you at? Where are you at? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. I'm trying to get on here. Yeah, and so yeah, 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 most most of the uh, it's basically one of us will come up with a a topic, usually some sort of video clip or something like that that we say, hey, you know, here here's a here's a a good video clip to to address, and so most of the preparation at there is uh, actually getting the video clip ready. If it's if it's a ten or eleven minute video, that means watching it, uh, figuring out how to divide it up, actually cutting the video up into all these sections, and uh, uh, you know, chopping it up, producing those as separate videos, then taking those videos, importing them into the program, making sure they're all correct and, and so on. So that, that's, that's, uh, that's about the preparation. All right. Well, uh, thank you everyone for, for, uh, joining us. Um, again, I will be, uh, I will be live tomorrow, but it's on Abdullah Samir's YouTube channel. So he'll be interviewing me over on his channel. The link is in the description box. So you can go over there and, uh, you know, get a notification now. And uh, all right, other than that, see you all tomorrow over on Abdullah Sabir's channel, and we should have an interesting discussion. This is a an ex-Muslim atheist interviewing an ex-atheist Christian. Always, always good material for uh, 
for discussion. So see you then. That will be, I believe, at 7 o'clock, 7 o'clock Eastern time tomorrow on that channel. All right. See you all then.